Good evening. Welcome to the October 11, 2017 Scarborough Zoning Boards of Appeals. Uh, we'll start with the roll call, please. Ms. Shoup? Here. Mr. Blaze? Here. Mr. Hebert? Here. Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Crockett? Here. And Mr. Lysol? Here. Okay. So have everybody stand and pledge allegiance, please. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a motion for the, uh, can I have a motion for the minutes of September 13th? Uh, August 13th will be, August will be in next month. Just a lot of work on it. Yes, yeah. sir. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Any discussion on that? Seeing that all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so the first appeal is the Ruit Family Cottage LLC for Championship, out in terms of Champion Street. So this is map U1, parcel 86. This is a return twice. 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 So we probably have had this out a while, so we'll kind of take it back from the beginning, not the beginning of the issues, but where we're at now and treat it just like a regular uh, process. We do have some notes from the town code enforcement officer. Do you have anything you want to add? Um, I'll, I'll defer to let the applicant present his case and then comment. Okay, yeah. whenever you're ready. Good evening. My name is Leo Bruette. I'm uh, one of the siblings of Bruette Family Cottage. There's six of us. My brother Jim is here with us tonight, and uh, we're all very anxious to uh, talk about the project. Uh, we have heard uh, your request for more information from our previous meeting, which was in August, and uh, you gave us a, 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 an extended period of time. We've got some, I think, very pertinent information that addresses some of the concerns raised in that meeting. And I, I just want to, uh, Walt's going to do the technical side of this, but I just wanted to point out the, there, there is a, a, a personal side to this. This is a, uh, a long-standing property within our family. We, we've had it since 1971. We've been coming up since 1956. Uh, this, this is something that uh, transcends uh, uh, generations, as we now have four sets of uh, family that have uh, continued to use this cottage, and uh, we've gotten to the point that, it, looking at the assessor's office, it, this is a building that was built in 1930, and it's it's tired, worn, and, and it's it's got issues. So we're at that point in time that, uh, in order to preserve our, our heritage, we want to uh, address all the issues. We want to do it right. Um, that's why we're actually got in the design the, the ability to get above floodplain levels both now and what we consider will be coming in the future and and we, we've we've watched the activity at Haken's Beach and, and right 50 feet 75 feet in 2013 the Demick property was a great template for us because that's the first time I've seen pilings used to bring a building up above floodplain levels so uh, all of that was good information for us and it puts us in a prime position to pursue this project. Uh, we just want to make sure that we've uh, addressed all the concerns and, and hopefully we have in, at the end of tonight's meeting. So at this point in time, uh, Walt, why don't you uh, pick up on the technical side of things. Thank you, Mr. Perrett. Well, one of the things that uh, Mr. Wilson, I know it's silly, but <laughs> oh, Walter Wilson from the design company. <laughs> nice to see you. Representing the Bruettes. <laughs> um, at the last meeting, uh, you had indicated you want some more information on the structure of the existing building. Um, we employed uh, Shelley Engineering to go out and take a look at it and do a visual inspection. And he actually crawled around the crawl spaces, the attics, and every place else in the building to look at it. Um, I believe you have that letter in your packet tonight. Um, now I'll go on to say that the existing building cannot be expanded by the 30% that's allowed or remodeled if it is to remain on the existing foundation. 
um, it cannot be done that way. The existing AE zone, which it is in right now, requires that any building must meet the elevation standards for flood uh, protection. Um, that would mean we'd have to raise the building up on pilings uh, because an, a horizontal expansion is not allowed at all and permitted. The new FEMA maps put the entirety of this lot in the VE zone. As a matter of fact, the VE zone right now stops at the seawall that bisects the property on, in the ocean frontage right now. Um, the maps that I've seen on the expanded VE go inland almost 200 feet to the other side of shipwreck. And if that takes place as expected it will, uh, the flood level then goes to 15 feet. Um, and then with the um, um, limitation of being a slower structural member above a foot above from the structures, we end up with a minimum height to be 18 2 elevation and we're at 11 foot 2 now. So the minimum we'd have to comply with the new FEMA map would be an elevation of 7 feet more and we're, pr we're proposing to go to 19 foot 2 so we can get some parking underneath in the piled areas. Um, now the existing building has structural deficiencies through it, quite, uh, quite significant, um, in that the roof raft is a 2 by 6, structurally it should be 2 by 10, the attic floor joist a 2 by 6, and structurally it should be 2 by 10s also. Um, also, the, if, that, if that was um, reframed and redone, the existing roof pitch would have to be made higher also because currently there were no ceiling ties across from rafter to rafter and the upstairs loft area is only seven and a half feet in the, minimum, in the middle and if we don't increase the roof pitch we're going to lose the ability to utilize the existing loft area. So we'd have to reframe the roof to second floor and raise the rafters up on the roof pitch. The resulting of that if you use a standard Cape Cod roof, a 12-12 roof pitch, we get the top of the building, uh, once you put it on pilings, 31 foot 7 inches above the ground. is that this is the existing building as it is right now, 18 foot 2, great top. We took that existing building and just put it over here on pilings and used the same building, raised it up if you could. Um, it would be 24 and a half feet high. But that would just take the existing problems and structural problems and transport them over here, raise them out of the ground. To satisfy those existing limitations in the building, we need to put a new roof on it, new floor joists, and the entire first floor outside walls have to be reframed. So if that was done and put the roof on it with a 12-12 pitch, we're up to 31-7. The proposal we have by building a new building is only three feet higher. <coughs> it's smaller in size and scale than what this building would be if we raised it up and reframed it to meet code. Uh, this building is actually shorter in length, it's 34 feet, the existing is 36 foot 4. This building has a two-story center, a one-story on the rear, so it limits the mass of the building that would be in the existing building, reframed, redone. Now, in order for that to happen, we have to put the pilings in the ground. The existing building is 28 by 36. There's no place on the site to put the building in order to construct the pilings. So it has to be moved off site. And like it says in the engineer report, that uh, the uh, width of the street at Higgins Beach, the width of the street, the logistics of getting a building that size in and out with the overhead utility lines, and then trying to find a place to put it, which is almost impossible. Um, we'd have to bring it back after. And after we brought it back, 
we'd set it up like in figure two on top of the existing building and then tear it all apart to make it structurally sound. Um, the total amount of expense is expended for actually no reason at all other than to move the building in and get it back. And the problem we have is that we do have the DEP approval to demolish and rebuild as shown in the detail four in your company packet. We do have approval from the town administration as far as meeting the character ordinance and the design, size, shape, and height that the zone requires. And the one stipulation is that we're here for is in the Shoreland Zone 75 foot setback from the resource, the ordinance says no new construction. Well, we have contended right along that this is not new construction because there is an existing house on the property. <coughs> as a matter of fact, the DEP also classified this as a reconstruction and specifically said it is not new construction. So we are here because of the wording of the ordinance that basically does not allow you to improve your house if you're within the 75 foot district in order to meet the new elevations and um, uh, floodplain levels and erosion hazard zone and all the other overlays. Now, the uh, <coughs> the possibility of moving the lot off site even if it, I mean the building off site, even if it was accomplished. When it came back and had to be reframed in order to meet the loading requirements and of, of, of the uh, building, which are inadequate, we're going to destroy 80 to 90 percent of the building once it gets back there um, in order to uh, accommodate the renovations. <clears throat> let alone the financial cost of doing that, <coughs> that type of solution is just not workable. The better solution is to grant the requested variance in order to reconstruct the proposed building as shown on the plans that has been submitted. This plan has been approved, like I said, by the Town Administrative Review. It's also been approved by the DEP. And, um, as, re as a report from Shelley Engineering, Patrick Jordan, the professional engineer, um, he said that the structure is extremely light framed. The house needs extensive reframing and re re uh, um, reinforcing, implemented on all levels in order to support the building code mandated loads. The report also says the floor joists and rafters are so undersized that they must be at least four inches deeper. That means going from two by sixes to two by tens. This would mean the removal and replacement of these members and installing rafter ties between the rafters at the top of the ridge. This would render the existing second floor loft area useless with the current roof pitch and would require the roof to be reframed with a steeper pitch in order to maintain the headroom in the loft area. He then writes about the property size restraints necessitating the moving of the building off-site in order to install the pilings and that logistics of moving the structure would be nearly impossible and would present insurmountable challenges. The second part of his report talks about utilizing the structure itself to support the renovations that would like to be done. <coughs> And he says the existing structure members are not capable of supporting the proposed expansion and concludes a replacement of this structure is warranted. Um, <coughs> so it becomes evident the applicant has limited options. One, do nothing. This would mean that the building would meet, not meet the existing and proposed requirements for the flood zone foundation requirements, DEP regulations and so forth, the flood insurance would balloon in yearly cost because the existing elevation does not meet those eleva uh, flood elevations. The building would be subject to rising flood level and future storms. The applicant wants to be in compliance with these regulations and protect his property. A do-nothing action 
does not accomplish this and would result in a diminishing return of the property. Next option is to, uh, option is to elevate the existing building. Well, we went through that a little bit. In order to do this, the building needs to be moved off site, brought down, re brought back, reconstructed, new roof pitch, new second floor joists. And the elevated structure would be placed on the pilings. And if we could even get it back in, 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 in off site, um, brought back, um, the economical and logistic problems of doing that would be not feasible because once the building was able to get back, it would be all taken apart again. The other one, the third option, is have the ZBA recognize the situation that the applicant is in and grant the requested variance so the building can be reconstructed on the property. A building that meets all the requirements of DEP, FEMA, and the Higgins Beach Character Code. And like I say, this is stymied because of the <coughs> new construction consideration within the 75-foot setback. Now, the ordinance allows the applicant to come to the ZBA for act, act for relief in a situation like this where the building is torn, taken down, torn down by himself, and, he, and the ordinance says he can come to the ZBA to ask for relief of that section of the ordinance. So we aren't trying to do anything that is not that is not permitted. We're trying to do things that would be permitted if we had the variance. And like I say, everything we're applying for meets all the requirements there are except for that one thing. Now, let's get into... One of the things that was mentioned in the staff report, if I can find it right here quickly, this was something that was brought up that had not been brought up before in, in, in conjunction with this project. This is one area of concern is the impact that increasing the living space would have on the already poor parking situations at the residence. It is believed that this cottage is mostly used as rental and therefore it is common to have seven cars parked on and off the property. Um, I don't know where that came from. I do have a copy of a rental agreement that is utilized when the property is rented, specifically talking about parking. And it says... The total number of persons living in the residence cannot exceed so many, and parking is provided for a maximum of two vehicles. That's in the lease report. Where this came from saying several residential cars are used, are parked on the site, I have no idea where that came from. It had not come up before. So the owners are aware of the parking situation at Higgins Beach, and the, their lease agreement, when they do lease, limits the cars to two. In this project, not only are we thinking of that, we're also providing a parking place underneath the building which now does not exist. So actually the owner is trying to allow for better parking arrangements than what exists there now. Um, and like I say, you had that letter from the engineer. I would like to add a couple of things where I said it before. I'll put, I'll put this out now instead of waiting until the question and answer period. Um, the existing building was built legally on a lot that was intended for residential use. Since then, the new rules and regulations have been placed on the property in order to anticipate rising tides. The owner desires to protect his property by complying with these regulations. If the requested variance is denied, it would result in a practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land because that action would deprive the owner of the ability to comply with the regulations and would place the established residential use on the land in jeopardy. 
And I say that because I believe that if you have regulations that mandate you put elevations at certain height to protect <coughs> other buildings, even if you're grandfathered, you should have the ability of bringing those built uh, those uh, the grandfather building up to coast. And that's what the owner is trying to do here. One of the things that was mentioned before at one of the previous meetings is, well, you don't have to bring it up to code. It's grandfathered. You can leave it there. That's not only bad property ownership, bad neighborhood policy, but it could lead to a lot of damage to buildings if this building is not properly elevated so that when a, a big storm does come through and a tidal wave of some sort hits it, it's going to be protected and elevated so the water can pass underneath. If it stays where it is, that building will be pushed inland and bump into other houses and make destruction in other areas other than just this property. So from the standpoint of the existing building and the hardship that the owner has, the hardship is not just so much the building itself. The hardship is a result of the potential damage that could happen to that building and abutting properties. And if the variance is not approved and we can't do this, then we're going to have a problem not only with this house but with abutting properties also. And I think that's a concern that the whole section of Higgins Beach on the shoreland should be aware of. And I think it's something that the board should be able to address and allow the existing building to be reconstructed as the DEP allows um, in a case like this for the protection of the property. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Uh, just want to set you in speak now, or do you to wait a little bit? Um, you can open the public hearing if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. Would anybody from the public like to speak to this? Feel free if you have anybody, feel free. If nobody wants to speak to it, <coughs> you're welcome to if you'd like. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing. Come back to the board for. Uh, uh, actually, I'd like to commit Mr. Longson, if you're ready to give it a, a site. I've got a couple of questions for you, anyways. Mr. Chairman, I would ask the board to take a look and see if they'd received any correspondence, yay or nay, for this project from the butters. The only one we got was a nameless one, which was a nay, a nay, and without putting a name on it, we don't give that any. I have two two letters that were delivered today from the butters. You want to bring it forward? You can. Thank you. Do you know the name on 8 Champion Street? Uh, yeah. yeah, I got that one. What about 8? That's uh, Scott. Real estate broker. Oh, okay. I think it's Scott and his wife, if I remember properly. Funny. What we have here is uh, we have a, a generic. I'm assuming that you wrote the letter to hand to them if they were willing to sign it, which is totally fine. Uh, just acknowledging what they're doing, I'll pass this down to the board members. And uh, from Scott Townsend at 8 Champion Street, he uh, says, in addition to being a neighbor, our company manages the property for the Brewett family. Uh, having been in the property on various occasions, I am a full agreement that it should be torn down and rebuilt. Uh, just for anybody that knows, Mr. Townsend is a uh, real estate agent in that area in the next door neighbor. The next one is from uh, Michael Fitzgerald of 6 Champion Street, and he has no comments other than that he signed it saying that he was, had no objections. I'll pass that one down to everybody. Mr. Chairman, if I could say one more thing in response to um, that letter, uh, that uh, staff report about the increased parking. Uh, the existing building has four bedrooms and a sleeping loft, and the proposed building will have four buildings 
bedrooms and the sleeping loft. So we are expanding sleeping area to accommodate more people. Okay, thank you. Yes. I closed that part of so just for technical reasons I'm like to reopen the public comment because those letters came in and I wasn't aware of them. And then I'll just close it once the board has had a chance to read those. And again, by opening it, it does allow for anybody to speak if they'd like. Feel free. Have any questions regarding those letters? I do have one question. Go ahead. In that, yes, it it's stated that you got approval from the BEP as well as your discussion earlier. Do we yes. have any record of that? I have the whole DEP approval here, and I have this, this, the Town of Scarborough approval for the design and so forth, subject to the ZBA action on the 75-foot thing. Um, do we have a copy of the information? I believe Brian has them. I have one, but it wasn't in your packet. Oh, I... It was sent to me directly by DEP. Okay. We have, is that the letter that we already have, or is that a different one? It's the DEP approval for... It's the... It's, it's the, not the letter with the, the first letter. Uh, this one here. This DEP approval was not your typical PBR approval. Um, the approval uh, ended up having to go through a hearing to uh, show that it complied with the Natural Resource Protection Act and Sand Dune Alteration Act. Okay, so, so, uh, so for Chair. <coughs> so, there's some confusion over which DEP letter. <laughs> <laughs> right. This, I don't know if I, this document was an email um, that was the response to my submittal to DEP, which I'm required to do by ordinance, and any time we receive a variance application for something in the shoreland zone. This was DEP's response, Mike Morris. He's, he's not this DEP. <laughs> this DEP is a, sec a separate DEP. <laughs> A separate department of DEP. This is the, the, the department that regulates the dunes, the Chapter 355 dune regulation. Mr. Wilson and I have had many hours of discourse about the differences between the dune regulations and the shoreland regulations, and it is very confusing. And and there are maybe not even subtle nuances between the two. There's some very very clear differences and sometimes the numbers don't don't jot. So it's very confusing for any applicant. It's confusing for me. It's confusing, I think, for the DEP <laughs> to deal with, quite frankly. Um, so, so just as a point of clarification in reference to the DEP approval, that was the, the NERPA Chapter 355 approval, uh, Natural Resource Protection Act, Sand Dune Alterations, Finding of Fact and Order. I received this on August 31st. It is an approval from that side of the aisle in DEP. That side of the aisle does not talk to the other side of the aisle, which is the aisle that I actually end up regulating, which is the shoreland zone. So once again, just to make those two distinct, I didn't create the rules. I only enforce <laughs> the rules. Those folks don't choose to talk together real well. I can't help that. Uh, it's my job to try to explain the differences and try to sort it all out in the end. Uh, and hopefully I do that halfway decently. But um, so, so Mr. Wilson is absolutely correct. They did receive NERPA Chapter 355 approval. The email from Mike Morrison, the, the shoreland coordinator, um, by the strict letter of the law, again, he's reading the strict letter of the law on a standard hardship variance appeal, and he stated his opinions, and Mr. Wilson stated his, his response to it or his thoughts on those opinions. And, and why he, he didn't feel it was fair and, and whatnot. And, and all I'm doing is reporting out what I got back. And this, um, is, this was stated in the May 7th meeting. Yes. Now, now I think, you know, in, in defense of the appellant, Mr. Morse didn't have the structural report that you folks now have in your, in your hands. So there, there are certain things that Mr. Morse didn't have in his possession. I sent him the packet that I received back in May. 
And so you should consider what new evidence maybe that you have in front of you that he may not have had. That, I mean, again, DEP's opinion is only DEP's opinion. It's offered for consideration. The board must consider it. Doesn't mean they have to follow it because there could be testimony here tonight that can sway that decision. And, and I think we tried to make that clear. Um, and I, I know how Mr. Wilson feels about that, but, but that's just the facts. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have a question for, on that issue? That's long stuff. So just one more point of clarification. Um, in, in most of what Mr. Wilson said is perfectly, it, it's perfectly factual. I agree with it. Uh, one, again, one thing when he talks about how DEP says that it, was, it wasn't new construction, that it was reconstruction. Again, that's on the NERPA side of the aisle. In our ordinance, in the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, replacement or reconstruction requires that building now to meet the standards for new construction doesn't call it new construction. It requires it to meet the standards for new construction. So whether the lot was previously developed or not is immaterial. Once you voluntarily tear something down, you must put it back like it was brand new, just like we were permitting it for the first time. And that requires those setbacks to be met to the greatest practical extent. And so that, that leads to another point in Mr. Morse's email that not, you know, he, he had some comments on what he thought that the criteria for hardship, uh, how that might not be able to be met. But one important thing is, and he's correct on further analysis, when you do move a building back, which the appellant um, proposes to do, they're going to move it and they're going to shorten the main building. That's all real good stuff. That's what the board likes to see. That's what we all want to see. They're improving that setback. The problem is they're coming back to the original front of the building with a deck that acts as the access to the front of the building. Mr. Morse in his email alludes to that and says that DEP would not, that, that goes counter to DEP's regulations. They, they would love and approve that six foot setback, but they would expect that to be the front of the structure, not then to add on the deck on front of that. And that's what, I just want to clarify that point. And, and certainly, as you guys are, where, are, are weighing the, the proposal, that needs to be addressed at some point. Whether that, whether you feel that that you know that deck needs to go on at the same um, uh, the same point as the existing front of the cottage. So, so in other words, by moving it back, that's good. Then you kind of erase that by putting the deck on there. If you move the whole thing back and put the deck on there. That would be different. Matter of fact, if the deck was only one foot further back, I think it still meets, you hmm. know, it would, it would resolve that issue. But placing it at the exact frontage of the existing cottage kind of nullifies the whole deal. DP's stance is you don't move the main house and then put appurtenances on towards the resource. And that, that has nothing to do with the design standards that we're That has nothing to do with the design <laughs> standards. The design that Mr. Wilson did meets, it, it was a difficult one because of the location on the lot, the, the street, the confluence of the streets and the turn. We, we went around it. I think they did a really good job at trying to meet the intent uh, and the spirit of the ordinance, and we, we found that they did meet it. The deck in and of itself is perfectly fine. The, the structure that he designed is perfectly fine from a character code standard basis. Now we're talking about shoreland zoning issues and, and, and where that building is located. Again. It's your, your, your folks' job to decide whether or not that, that um, you know, if, 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 you, if you, that, you feel that, uh, I don't know how to say, if you feel that that's warranted. Purely from a character code standpoint, this building meets. The building that you're looking at meets. Um, the shoreland and, and the other regulations kind of confuse that a little bit and make it more complicated. And I'm, I'm not sure if I've, I've probably made it more complicated. No, you've actually done a good job with it. Uh, can you clarify something for me? Mm -hmm. Is the reason why they're saying that adding the deck on is creating a back dune problem? Is that what they're saying? No, or? it's simply that any, any structural um, addition toward the, the, whenever you replace a structure, you're supposed to move it back to the greatest practical extent. This lot has definite constraints to, to moving it back 
A, you can't move it back to the 75 foot because it doesn't exist. It would be off the lot. Um, so they're trying to move it back to the greatest practical extent. And in moving it back six feet, that's, that's heading in the right direction. That's moving it back. But then to put a deck on front of it, you kind of nullified that under the, under, under the shoreland zoning regulations. So if you move the building back um, and put it in, and added a deck, but the whole thing was back further than the existing structure, then technically you've, you've met that test. What they're proposing is to put that deck on at the same place that the current front of the building is. See the difference? If you, if you took that whole thing, just as they designed it, and moved it back so it was a foot or two or more back from that existing front of the structure, I think Mr. Morse's argument would be resolved. I think that would... Um, how, how wide is the deck? The deck is, how deep is, is The deck is only six feet wide. So if they made it five feet, 11 inches, everything is fine. Well, <laughs> Mr. Wilson and, and the appellant have done a good job at trying to follow the character code, and the character code requires that front porch, which this is taking the place of, because the building is elevated by more than six feet, you are allowed to use a deck in place of a porch because it's really hard to put a porch up six, six feet off the ground. So decks all the time are built, you know, higher than that. So they allow that. The, we, we agreed that the minimum width of the deck had to at least be the same minimum width as, as the porch, which is six feet. That's why the deck is designed to six feet. It's not, I, in no way am I saying the deck is more than they deserve or it's egregiously large. It's the minimum. Uh, no argument there. It's the minimum width. It's just the location ends up being at the existing front of the building. And I'm only tell you know I'm only trying to explain this to address the point in Mr. Morris's email. Uh, you're doing great with it because one of the things I'm struggling with is what trumps what. Something's got to give one way or the other. It, yeah. it, it, and I think that's one of the questions the board has to answer is if we decide this is something that we should approve, what is going to be the heavier? You've got two competing issues. Exactly. And, and, and again, the appellant needs something to, because they're elevating the structure, they now need to create access to that raised structure. Arguably, does that have to be on the front, the beach front side of the structure? Maybe, maybe not. You, you know, it's certainly possible to put access on the side, but that's actually taking the place of a front. Uh, you know, so you usually have an entrance on the front of your building because it's beachfront. You have a so I think it's reasonable to have that. The whole question is, where where does that exist on the lot as far as sliding it back? And again, they don't have a lot of room to slide back. It's the board's decision to say, yeah, we think that meets it, or is there any way that that can exist a few feet back? More. I, I, you know. Can I ask you one more question on that? What is the current building is how long? The current building is 30... 36 foot 4 inches. And did I understand that you're saying that your proposal is to make it 6 feet shorter? Or 34 feet. feet. 34 feet. 2 so foot 4. 2 feet back? Yeah, and then we're going to move the building back 4 feet, so the 2 feet we save in length and the 4 feet we gain by moving back allows for the 6 foot porch to be in the front such that it doesn't extend any closer to the resource than what the existing building does now. But the total the total structural length then becomes 40 feet. Okay, and that's again maybe necessary because of the elevation. I'm I'm not making that decision. That's, oh, thank you. I think that's sort of part of what you guys have to decide. Thank you very much. Anything else you want to add? Um. Uh, no, I think uh, Mr. Walt Wilson uh, covered the. Uh, you know, the whole issue of substantial improvement whenever you're doing anything to an existing structure in the floodplain, if the cost of that improvement, even if it's repair um, or, you know, significant maintenance, <coughs> if the cost of that ex it meets or exceeds 50% of the market value of the structure, you've triggered substantial improvement, which is a term that means you now have to bring the entire structure, not just an addition or whatever you're working on, but the entire structure now has to meet floodplain management ordinance standards, which gets to the elevation issue. And he's also correct in that the, the smart money says you don't elevate to the existing base flood elevation. You elevate to the proposed preliminary firms that, that FEMA has now put out because 
it, again, it only makes sense. If you're going to all that trouble, you need to elevate to that, that, uh, to that higher standard. And FEMA backs that up. I spent a week in, in uh, Maryland at a training, and they said, yeah, even though that's not an effective map yet, you haven't adopted it, that's your best available data, and you should use that. Makes sense. I have a question for Mr. Wilson. Absolutely. So, Mr. Wilson, um, what, just and forgive me if this has been asked and explained already. Um, I know, like as we've been said, this has been going on since May. So please just refresh my memory. Well, if you um, come up with a question I haven't considered, it would be you, you're a better better thought thinker than I am. <laughs> I'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, so why was this sent to the coastal sand dune department of the DEP instead of the shoreland um, section of DEP, i.e. Mr. Morris? It was originally sent in as a PBR approval. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> if you, could I borrow that packet from the DEP back? Sure. Right here. I got a little history of the project here. The applicant submitted the permit by rule notification pursuant to Chapter 305, Permit of Rule Standards section, for a rebuild of a cottage in the frontal dune. This PBI was found deficient because the project required an individual Natural Resource Protection Act and sand dune permit and was returned back on May 10th of last year. Subsequently, we refiled for the DEP approval under the natural action, uh, National Resource Action. So it was a situation where the DEP determined that we had to go this route, not that we determined. Okay. Other questions from the board? I would like to answer one thing about that <coughs> letter from DEP from Mike Morris. In regards to the deck, he didn't say it wasn't allowed. What he said, he referred it back to the town for consideration and review during the process. I think Mr. Longstaff made right. that pretty clear. So he didn't say it wasn't denied. He also um, said it may have not been common practice to have a deck like that put on the house. But then the whole application was sent through and the DEP approval showing all that and the uh, proposed plot plan, and they agreed to everything as being met with the standards. So his one letter opinion, if you're looking at who should override who, I would think the formal vote by the, uh, by the DEP after hearing all, of, all the information in front of a panel and they decided it was okay, you know, uh, well, the initial it, opinion Longstaff may have been out, different. As Mr. Longstaff pointed out from the board's point of view, they are two separate departments. So this doesn't, one doesn't negate the other. They both carry weight. The question is, in this circumstance, what's the right answer? Is that a fair? So and, and just to clarify, the letter says, uh, the applicant states that the reconstructed structure will be re relocated six feet further away from the shoreline than the existing structure, and a new six-foot wide deck will be constructed within that same area. This is highly inconsistent with the state requirements and town ordinance requirements to relocate a non-conforming structure to make it more conforming outside of the scope of the variance request. In other words, if there was no variance request and, or needed and, and the, they came to um, uh, the town staff with this request, the department would not take issue with the proposed new structure in the new location six feet further from the shoreline, but the town could not permit the new deck. As, as, and I think what he meant to say, as proposed. And, and he's right, he's not saying you can't have a deck. As proposed is really, I think, what you have to read into that. And of course that triggered in the character ordinance which requires a minimum of six foot deck in order to meet the character ordinance. Well, that's, that's, I and think the stairs are linked to it. So I guess that's one of the questions I have. He, he wasn't aware of that is what I'm saying. Right, but um, the character ordinance to me, if you're looking at the priorities, I'm going to make an assumption based on if I had to guess who would win in a war. Um, I guess as DEP, sand dune kind of takes it, and maybe second is shoreland, and I think the character is probably last place. 
So I'm less worried about character audience than I am about the EP personally. You know, uh, other, other than the fact the character audience is the zoning audience. Well, but, so the, but the, the character, character audience, zoning audience uh, the, I know the character audience reality. works to your advantage, but it, it, that's exactly one of the reasons why I give it the least amount of weight. So that, I think, is really important. One of the questions, again, as Mr. Longstaff pointed out, is it reasonable to go down to a five-foot deck if that, re if that meets the requirement and ends the debate? If I may, I mean, Mr. Wilson's right that a six-foot deck is the minimum, but the ordinance doesn't say you have to have a 34-foot deep building. You could have a 33-foot deep building or a 32-foot deep building or a 30-foot deep, you know, there's, there's, so you can't, you can't say, well, we're, we're told we have to have a six-foot deck. The whole issue is, can you move it back from the existing front of, where the existing front of the structure is? That's the whole point. Um, and meet the character code at the same time. And there's ways to do that. Does it, is it what the appellant wants? Probably not, but the fact of the matter is there's ways to do that. Well, one of the problems in moving the building back any further to the property line, there's a 10-foot easement that runs along that, that line. And our proposal is to have the building 18 feet from that, 10, from that rear line which only gives the owner eight foot of travel space because of the easement along the back of the property, which is for the abutting property, and also the water company lines run through there. <coughs> so moving the building back further would then in not make it able for the owner to pull up a car on his property without being over the easement, which would impede on the abutter's use of the easement. So. Moving the building back any further away to the rear lot line would be impractical as far as the owner is concerned. Do you have other pictures, uh, drawings on that, or is that the only one? Is that the latest drawing? Is it the only one? Because we, we didn't. What do you want to look any, at? I just wanted to have, if there are other pictures there, we did not receive any current drawings. So I'm wondering whether or not they are different than the drawings we have in our package. They're the same one you got. They are the same. Okay. Same thing. Thank, thank you. So, so, that easement I'm go talking about is the building is the ocean, 10 foot wide right through here that runs through the back. So by moving the building back to where it is, the owner just has eight feet in the building that's his own without being infringing on the abutter's easement. Thank so you. a question regarding the parking. You said by elevating the building, you'd be able to park, is it a car underneath it, so you'd gain one or two extra spots? So you currently you can have two spots legal on the property, is that correct? I'm not sure what it is, to be honest with you. Okay. I don't know. Um, it, it, I know that he restricts it in his when he leases it to two two vehicles, but okay, you know. So can I ask the so Absolutely. two vehicles? Is that correct? Okay, they said yes. Um, by this addition, would you be increasing for two additional vehicles or one additional vehicle? Oh, for the for the raising of the building. Excuse oh, me. oh, I think you know. But the total of could you just repeat what he said? Because still, still two vehicles with the raising of the building. Okay. It just gets it off of that limited front setback from the building to the street to allow, allow them to pull it under the building to allow more room for the okay. other vehicle. And, the, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, by raising the building, the cars would be going underneath the building, underneath the home, correct? Yes. So if the home moved back, a few feet, could you still park the vehicles under the building? Because it's under the building. You still could park them under the building. Uh, so on. you wouldn't lose parking because you're only restricting it to two vehicles anyways? Right. So there's only room for one under the house. Right. Just one under the house. Okay. And the other one would either park right directly in front of the building or on that eight foot setback between the rear building and the easement line. But but still but if you still would if you still raised the home and moved it back you would have one vehicle under the building and then basically a vehicle right behind it is that true? Not not not, not right behind it under the building it would be outside. Correct, but you would still have capacity for two vehicles. Two vehicles. Okay, if you move the house back a few feet. Yes, but then you'd lose that little strip that's currently between the easement and the back of the house, which is eight feet. If you moved it back further, you wouldn't have a place to park a, a guest car or a... So the second car wouldn't be able to be parked there? Well, it should also be noted that that easement is the driveway for our next-door neighbor. The next-door neighbor needs 
drive behind. I'm sorry, sorry. Could you take the mic? Yeah, and state your name. Speaker, yeah. Sorry about that. Just state you. your name and address. Are, uh, my name's Jim Bruett. Uh, there are there are two houses next to each other. Is this the ocean? The street is here. Our house is here. This is the Fitzgerald's house. Their only access is through that back easement to mm -hmm. get to their house. The further back we move our house, this is what Mr. <coughs> is talking about. It's not just our space, it's their driveway we're beginning to infringe on. So that's why the design. So Mr. Wilson, you're saying there's an eight foot. Just further expand on that just a little bit. This whole lot is black topped, except for that 10 foot easement which, which the water comes <coughs> <coughs> that space that we're talking about, that eight foot space between the easement and the back of the property, ends up being the driveway, which you can see on the site plan, is all paved. That's where the access line is for the house next door. So if you move the house back any further, they're going to restrict their access to their property, because that is the only access they have. So moving the building back further would, would, would take away the access to the other house. <coughs> so you, you're saying there's only eight feet now for that road? Right now, there's 12. But we're moving the building back four feet. Results in eight. So now you're bringing the vehicle. What's on the other side of the easement? And which side are you talking about? Uh, Plan View North. I want to know in what here? Yes. That's the water company's easement with water pipes, water lines, and... Uh, is it paved? No, or is it that's the section that's not paved. So right now you've got 10 feet, of, uh, 12 feet of pavement, and you're taking away four feet of pavement. <coughs> yes, it's going down to eight feet wide. Yeah, and when I say it's not paved, there is about a foot and a half of that 10 foot easement that does have pavement on it that runs along the easement right now, and the water lines and so forth run through here, and I guess that's the closest they let them get to the water lines with pavement. So with the movement of the building back four feet, you're going to have nine and a half feet of driveway width for that. Yes. That's correct. Well, you're... I, I'm going to give you some of my opinions and see what the board thinks overall. We already did. Oh, it's still open. Thank you very much. Let's close the public comment part. Thank you. And uh, let's, here's a couple of thoughts that I've got for you on the concept. Number one, I think we've got a plan that the town seems to be okay design-wise, standard-wise. Is that fair? The way it looks? So we've got that. So that's a big accomplishment. We've got, if we left the property in the exact same place, uh, but built it up, I don't have a problem with that concept because I think it's reasonable. And for the record, uh, I checked the, the value of the property based on the town's assessment and the, the building's appraised at 80900 So you probably hit forty about the time you put a garage door on it. Um, so it's, that's a pretty easy baseline to meet to, to decide whether or not, in my opinion, uh, and even if you say, well, the town appraises low, all right, let's double it. $160,000, it's still not going to take any time to go through 80000 So, So based on that thing, I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. I think it answers some questions we may have. The property is not necessarily because of the deck. The property is not necessarily becoming more in conformance. It's moving back. However, if we gave the deck at five feet, we're in fact exactly in the same frontage spot. So we've moved back four feet. We've gone to five feet, which gets us into, and please jump in if you see something I'm saying wrong, Mr. Longstaff. It seems like we're talking about a foot. And there's two ways to deal with that foot. Shorten the building, shorten the deck. Because the reality is, if there's a reasonable solution, and the definition of a reasonable solution would be shortening the deck a foot, uh, then I would argue that you have to honor that. Um, Thoughts from the board? I agree with you 100%. Mr. 
The thing that really bothers me is here's a family that has a house. They've had it for 40, 50 years, and it's slowly going to hell because it's wearing out. Like so many of the old cottages down at the Higgins Beach. To me, they have a right to rebuild that. And because of all the laws and the, the regulations and the ordinances that we have, they're, they're just going against each other. And this poor family, all they want to do is they want to have a house that, by the way, meets all the current regulations and something that they can enjoy. So, I mean, if it's, if it's a foot that we're talking about, give them a foot. Other board members. My initial issues with the appeal when you brought it, it was two months ago when it first came to us. Big one was structural. I think you've addressed that with uh, with the letter from the engineer. I think it does a good job of explaining what needs to be going on with the structure, and it's an outside professional opinion. I think it was a great approach. My second issue was around the letter that came from Morris at the DEP. And again, I think if you look through the record, my I, there were two things that came, or three things I had highlighted, and I think I actually wrote uh, read them into record. And the first one was that deck that they wouldn't allow the debt based on, and it's his opinion. But I agreed with his opinion, so I'm still struggling with that today. And I think in order to get where we need to be, there has to be some kind of concession around that deck. And I don't want to shorten the building because you're taking away a usable space inside the structure, which is the higher value as far as I'm concerned for the family. But does it have to be a six-foot deck? Can they get away with a four-foot deck? And then we've given some concession to move it back away from the water getting close to where it needs to be, in my opinion. I don't know if we can do that or not, but again. I, I think that anything we're doing here is ground shattering. So I think we can do a lot of different things yeah. as long as our logic is sound, and we have to be able to defend our logic. I mean, I have less concern around the character. If we have to take the deck off the front and it doesn't meet the character uh, requirements, I'm fine with that. Again, this is shoreland zoning. I have a bigger concern around that. That's how I look at it. I mean, I don't want to di discount our rules. No, because we agreed to that. I mean, we were part of this, the thought process behind that. I agree with that. But I think I would compromise in the character code first. Yeah, if, if the CEO felt that was reasonable, I would agree. Yeah. Just for the board's information, you know, the variance appeal, which is what you're hearing, um, is to hear and decide appeals requesting such variance from the terms of this ordinance as will not be contrary to the public interest where owing to special conditions, a literal enforcement of the provisions of this ordinance. So it's not just dimensional requirements, and that's why anytime somebody has talked to me about can I tweak the character code, I steer them towards this variance because it says the provisions. It doesn't say setbacks, yard size, or lot area, yeah. like a practical difficulty would. And, and in fact, that isn't available to them anyway. So you have the, I think, leeway in whatever you approve to make conditions or changes that reflect where you want to go with this, with this ordinance. So I think you do have the leeway to do those kinds of things if you want to. Um, it's not a, it wasn't expressly asked for in their application, but I think that you have, you can place it as a condition of approval. Yeah. Whatever dimension or changes or character changes you want to make, I guess. Thank you. I, I, can I say something on that? Uh, not, not yet. Let the board walk through it, and then you can get a, get a feel of where we're at, and then we'll go from there. I mean, with nine and a half feet on the pavement area behind the home, it's kind of pushing it. You might be able to take a foot away, get down to about eight and a half feet, but typical width on our vehicle is around six feet. You need a foot on either side to feel comfortable. Not that there's a structure on the opposite side. They'd be kind of hugging the, the grass where the other utilities are located. So I think they can do some of that, but I mean, if you took a foot off going backwards, you might gain something, but much more than that, I think you're shrinking it up. And we're hurting the neighbor. Is it Correct, you're, hurting the, you're punishing the neighbors for the modification. Again, I'd much rather move on that front porch and, and 
take it off the front, and then we are getting further away from the, the resource. If, if, Mr. Wilson, is there anything based on your design experience that can be done with that porch so that they can still have a porch, but we can shrink it to, say, four feet? Is it could be five possible? feet. I think five feet? Or? Yeah, five feet is more realistic. Four, you, you get a four-foot porch time you put the railings on it, yeah, it's down short. to about three and a half feet. So five feet, five feet would work. Rail. Yeah, we agree. I agree with that. I, Okay. I actually don't have a problem with the six, but I think the problem is we have to still meet the rules of the variance. At the same vein, I think we can work in conjunction with each other to bring it as close as possible. And if five feet eliminates that issue, then yeah, we don't perfectly meet <coughs> the town's codes, but I think we meet the intent of the town's codes. I think we've solved the issue justifying the four requirements. But from a character standpoint, when someone stands at the front of this building, they're not going to say, oh, look at that, a five-foot porch, how'd they get away with that? Yeah. Right? Well, the, re the reason the six is just like Brian said. Right. The minimum width for a porch was six feet, and this substituted for the porch, so it became six feet. Right. Got you know, it. If I had thought we could get it reduced to five feet, I would have probably built it at five feet. Right. Uh, that's important. Thank yeah. Could you repeat that again? Because that's important to me. What's that? We want to try and work with the applicant. I think that was very well put. Uh, Mr. Blay said it perfectly. Uh, but we have the, the realities. If you're saying that the five-foot issue isn't a problem, I don't think I personally have a problem with walking through the rest of these and finding the four requirements being met. Again, we haven't gone through it. We haven't walked through it yet. But I can kind of feel, I would feel safe with that. I think they've done a fantastic job of dealing with the other concerns we have. I respect you coming in. Thank you very much. Uh, where's the board on that feeling? Or do they think the six feet is fine and would they prefer to see the six feet? I have a question regarding that, and this is more directed to you, Brian. Um, as, as board members, we're not <coughs> architects or engineers, so, uh, but is it possible, and in the sort of character of what we're doing here, not to overuse the word character, but... Um, can we put a stipulation on it that the deck must be five feet in width? Is that a stipulation that we could put on this? Yes, we can. Okay. Because I know, I, and again, I, I know we're not, we're not architects or designers here, and this is not our role to do this, to tell you that, you know, your house should be yellow or black or whatever. Um, but if we are allowed to do that, then, <laughs> um, if we are allowed to do that, then that would uh, satisfy some concerns that I have anyways. Okay, thank you. Yep. Well, plus, Mr. Wilson's already said that he's able to do that. Yeah. Right, and hearing that makes right. That's great. so. I, I'd like to continue with this. If uh, one of the Brewett family wouldn't mind standing up to just state whether or not that is comfortable, we'll I'll move that we go in that direction. If not, we can continue to debate. I have no problem with that. No structural issues. I see it works because you put some chairs. Right. <coughs> no, uh, for the record, uh, we, we could accept the five foot deep deck, and uh, that would be acceptable to us from the 16. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll move. Well, we have to go through the requirements. Yes. So why don't we start off with that? And Mr. Wilson will put you back to work. Uh, but you can probably do an abbreviated version. Uh, the, the land in question. Uh, cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. I think I've read these before. You but have, but because <laughs> of the delay, because it's, it's been May, I think... Shortened version. Yeah, you can use the... I think you can kind of get a sense of the board when we actually like something, too. So you probably can move it a little quicker. Okay. In order to protect the residential building and the residential use of the property from flood elevation, both current and, fi and future, the structure needs to be elevated and supported by pilings. The existing structure was not intended to be supported by this type of foundation, and due to the framing of the existing cottage, trying to utilize it on site would be futile at best. In order to comply with the regulations imposed by the pro on the property by DEP overlay districts, a new building meeting these restrictions is proposed. If the variance is not great on the property, would not meet the erosion hazard area requirements, would not meet the flood zone requirements, would not be in comp compliance with the character base ordinance of the uh, Scarborough zoning. In order to maintain the long-established use of the land to protect the structure from 
damage due to flooding and also comply with the regulations and the requirements that have been placed on the property, the land in question, in our opinion, <coughs> cannot yield a reasonable return without granting a variance. Thank you. Uh, the uh, land, I'm sorry, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. The need for a variance is due to several factors. The property is bisected by a seawall that reduces the land area to the existing grandfather size of 50 foot by 73 feet. This property is located within the 75 foot setback from the resource of the Atlantic Ocean. The town of Scarborough zoning imposes building setbacks that cover most of the property. The property orientation to Champion Street is not consistent with other properties in the area. Due to the DEP overlay districts and improvements to the property that are needed in order to comply, create a unique circumstance that is uncommon condition not shared by many in the Higgins Beach neighborhood. In order to comply with these unique circumstances, a variance is requested. The granting of the variance will not result, I'm sorry, will not alter the essential character of the locality. The granting of the requested variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. The plans have been reviewed by the town of Scarborough Administration Review for compliance with the uh, character ordinance and has uh, been approved for building size, height, location, and design. And also in the DEP approval, they also looked at the same thing in regards to uh, uh, the uh, character of the property and the abutting neighbors, and they concluded in their report that uh, it would have no effect on that. Thank you. And the last is that the, the, the uh, hardship is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. The hardship is not a reaction taken by the applicant or prior owner. The hardship is the applicant's desire to comply with the regulations and requirements that have been placed on the property by the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance and the various DEP overlay districts, the FEMA floodplain and the erosion hazard designation. This property was developed for residential use before any of these districts was imposed on the property. Thank you. Okay, let's come back to the board for a motion. Do I have a motion from the board? I move to approve appeal number 2605 under the condition that the deck width is reduced from 6 feet 0 inches in width to 5 feet 0 inches in width. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none. Um, sorry. Uh, seeing none, let's discuss the uh, lines item by item. Uh, that the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Just sat down with the Mr. Carpenter. Um, normally this is one that I would say no on, but there's been a good report documented on it showing us that the structure wouldn't withstand if we were going to do what we did. And I don't know which one of you had the, the tax bill. Yeah, the tax bill. So, I mean... I think that that's okay with me on this. Normally, I wouldn't be. Just for the record, because yeah. yeah, no, I've already seen. It. <clears throat> I'd add to that the uh, Shelley Engineering report that came out September 28th answered the question of the value of the property if the structural modifications were not made. I think it was pretty clear that uh, that that's valid proof that it would lose its value. Uh, my comments mimic Mr. Loisel's in that I support having the third-party independent engineering company, a licensed professional engineer, sort of take a look at this. Um, it adds a, a, a level of depth to it that I personally like to see when these hardship variances come forward. I agree with everything you said. Okay. No, I mean, I agree with the board. I think between seeing the inspection and hearing the actual value of the building, um, clearly, you know, they need to make some improvements. And um, uh, that the landing question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. I, uh, I agree. I think the easiest piece for me was the, uh, the tax bill. Uh, and knowing full well that you can't really do much on even it, it, what you're doing is the right thing to do long term. It's the right thing for the community. It's the right thing for the environment. And, and the family. Uh, and I do think that you can't, long term, the risks outweigh the benefits, and certainly I don't believe you can move that building and put it anywhere else. So uh, I, meet, I feel it meets that. And this will all be part of the uh, finding of facts and conclusion of law. Uh, all in favor of A being met. And that's unanimous. Thank you. 
The need to the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Mr. Clark, if you don't mind, I'll just work with you all the way down. Yeah, um, yeah it's totally unique circumstances of the property. You've got a new flood zone that's coming in. They're trying to circumvent that and get ahead of that, which is good because Mr. Wilson's correct. I mean, I deal with flood insurance for folks, and it's, it's going to be a little bit insane when some of these new flood planes come out. So if they're already doing something to help themselves out, it's it's the right thing to do. I agree with that as well. Um, all these frontal properties have this issue. Um, the difference here is uh, with the new ordinances that are coming out by the state, I think they're doing their best, as was uh, identified by the town, that we're not necessarily raising it to the height of the existing ordinance, but we're looking down the future uh, and preparing for what's coming. So I think you're doing the right thing. In, uh, and I agree. I agree with Ms. Staden. I don't have anything further to add. I agree with everything that's been said. I agree. I mean, I think the applicant has demonstrated how unique the property is with the different zones that it's in. Thank you. And uh, again, the uh, need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property and not the general condition of the neighborhood. I agree with the board. I think it's a specific circumstance with a specific property that maybe wanted to either side of it, but that's nothing to do with uh, with needing to change an ordinance to meet this need at the town level. So uh, all in favor of B being met. Again, that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, the, the, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. I agree. I, I mean, we've got houses down that are already starting to do this. I mean, the only way it could alter the essential character is if the big storm does hit, like Mr. Wilson said, and goes underneath that, takes out the house behind it. But, yeah, I think it's definitely. I think Mr. Wilson went out of his way to uh, make sure that it met the character code that we have here, and we're modifying it by one foot, bringing the deck back to five feet. I don't think that changes the character. <coughs> In this particular instance, it doesn't change the character. I agree, and I have nothing further to add. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't really have anything more to add. I agree. I mean, I think they're trying to come more in conformance with the character base, you know, character down there. Even. And again, the character, I'm sorry, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. I'm going to throw a couple things in here. Number one, we had to table this twice because the first two we didn't believe as a board did meet criteria of the the character based uh, that was one of the reasons why we ended up tabling it so it's a good lesson for anybody else is coming forward I think it does now and so I personally believe it does meet it it doesn't meet it to the T but it meets it to a reasonable expectation so I would be uh, in support of that being met all in favor of C being met that's unanimous thank you and if the hardship is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner no, as far as I can see and what I've heard for discussion, there's been nothing that the applicant prior owners done to make this a result of anything they've done. I agree. It doesn't sound like there's been major changes over the history of the structure and uh, the ordinance, or excuse me, the rules have changed underneath the building, not the building. So I agree with Mr. Lizzo. Yeah, as I said before, it's all the ordinances and the laws and everything like that that have come about since this the cottage has been built that's forcing them to do this. I agree with the board. And again, the hardship uh, is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. I think it's pretty straightforward. All in favor of DB that? That's unanimous. Do we have a motion for the, actually we have a motion on the table. We got a second. And so do I have a, uh, oh, all in favor of uh, this approval as requested and with the 15 feet. Five feet. Five feet. Feel the motion as written. As, yeah. Thank you very much. That's unanimous. Congratulations. Best of luck to you all. Thank, Thank you very much. But I do want to ask a clarification uh, sure. on that deck, making it five feet. Are you, do, are you anticipating moving the front of the deck back the foot or are you moving the back building forward? We're just saying to make the deck five feet instead of six feet. 
front of the deck back was my intent. That's what you're yeah. thinking. So just way the back where it is and just pull it in a foot. Yeah. Leave right. the nine and a half feet on the back side. Away from the natural body. And could I ask for maybe a five minute break before I do the next one? <laughs> <laughs> We have a shot agenda <laughs> tonight, so sure. I don't think it'd be a problem. Mr. Chair, I make a motion to take a five-minute recess. <laughs> uh, granted. We could have just done a quick appeal. Okay, I'll uh, re-adjourn, bring back the meeting from adjournment, and so let's uh, come back with appeal number uh, 2016. <coughs> it's a practical difficulty variance request by Martin and uh, Mary Doherty.
21 Ocean Avenue, parcel, uh, Assessor's Map U2, Parcel 7. Welcome again, sir. Uh, Walter Wilson from the Design Company. Uh, I'm representing Martin and Mary Doherty in a request for a practical difficulty variance in order to expand the house located at 21 Ocean Avenue in Higgins Beach in the CDCR1 district. Properties identifies tax map U2 lot 70 and is, has a size of 75 foot by 100 foot in depth. The property is improved with a two-story residence with an attached garage. The request, before, the request before the board is for a reduction in street frontage that will allow for the proposed vertical expansion above the existing garage as shown on the plans. The, the proposed additions meet all the dimensional requirements of the CDCR1 zone including property line setbacks, height restrictions, except for the stipulation that a 90-foot um, street frontage is imposed in the district on a property that it tains, contains an estate wing. And the existing garage on the property, dimensional-wise, is an estate wing dimensional situation. Um, you clarify the definition of a state wing? That's not state wing is in the character-based ordinance, which I know you particularly <laughs> don't <laughs> feel that is. confirm <laughs> their opinion about. And uh, <laughs> it is in, uh, it's defined on uh, Article 415 with a picture of what an estate wing is. And the estate wing is a multi-story extension from one side of the main body of a building and it says the state wings are only allowed on 98-foot lots, wide lots. Um, what is the restriction on the estate wing is that the width of the building, the width of the estate wing, can be the same as the principal building. And the uh, projection can be the same as the principal building. In this case, it re results in an area of 32 foot by 32 foot. Uh, originally, uh, in the first request for administrative review, uh, it was stated by the staff that it mostly resembled a side wing. Now, a side wing can be built on a 50-foot lot. It doesn't have that 90-foot frontage requirement. But the width can only be one-half the depth of the principal building for a one-story and only one-third the depth of the principal building for a two-story. And this would amount into a, a side wing that could only be eight foot three by eight foot three. And the existing garage building that's attached to the building is 20 foot seven by 22. So by putting the expanding two bedrooms over the garage, which is 20 by 22 basically, it's within the 32 by 32 foot area that is allowed for a state wing. So our contention is that the addition over the garage classifies by definition in the ordinance more closely to an estate wing than a side wing uh, because the side wing would be too small to utilize. It would only be 8 foot 3 by 8 foot 3 according to the ordinance. So by <coughs> calling it an estate wing and making it two-story, we are proposing that then the now non-conforming garage, which by the way is not allowed in the zone at all to be attached to the house when, when, this, when this was uh, first applied for, uh, it makes that non-conforming garage a two-story building and in an estate wing a garage is allowed to be put into an estate wing so we are making the, the house itself in what we call compliance with the character code as far as the building goes. We're also proposing a rear addition to this building, which is also an allowable permitted extension of the building uh, in, the, in the character zone. Everything meets all the setbacks, all the height restrictions, um, in, except for the one little um, notation on uh, street frontage. A uh, state wing has to have 98 foot of frontage, and we have 75 foot. So what we're looking for is a dimensional reduction on the zoning requirement of 98 feet down to 75 foot for street frontage. 
Other than that, everything else meets and complies with the ordinance. Thank you. Um, any letters on this one? We have two, I think, right? So I've got a letter from uh, 24 Ocean Ave. It's uh, to Mr. Longstaff from Martin and Mary Torrey. No, oh, oh, subject. Uh, what was his name? Brian, Jeannie and Brian Day, sorry. Um, Mr. Longstaff, thank you for your office's letter of 927. Since 1987, I have owned the property of 24 Ocean, which is directly across the street from the Dorries. Please note that our family is in favor of the board granting the variance to enable them to construct their estate wing over their garage. Considering very an interesting uh, construction that has occurred at Higgins in recent years, our feeling is that their changes would continue to enhance our neighborhood and provide utility to their family. The Dorries have been respectful and helpful neighbors jumping in to help move and uh, and unasked. Uh, they keep the property well maintained and look, looking top notch. Thank you for your consideration. I also received a, uh, I was meeting with uh, Karen Vashon, who's their neighbor to the left. Is that correct? Uh, Ms. Vashon and I were talking about something else, and um, she actually came out saying that she felt this was a very good idea and it would be beneficial for everybody in the neighborhood, and she thought they had done a good job with it. So uh, she was in support of that. So if the board will accept that, that does, you know, you'll call that that was something else that took place. All right. Uh, anybody from the public wish to speak on this? Welcome to the I'm Darty, and uh, I guess that what we're just looking to, to do is that uh, the new ordinance is, it, it, is uh, trying to shape shape things, and that's appreciated. This is just to try to understand the gap. There aren't many, too many um, lots that are 75 feet wide, so that this is the kind of a gap between the 50 and 100 foot uh, one. That's, that's Thank you. Can okay, we close the public hearing part and come back to Mr. Longstaff? Anything you'd like to add with this one here? Um, no, uh, this is, uh, I'll just restate, this is, uh, appears to be the appropriate vehicle to, to you know, for, to request this type of relief, uh, practical difficulty, um, variances for dimensional um, requirements uh, or lot area uh, or frontage. So I think it meets, certainly meets those, uh, as far as an eligible project to come to the board with under the practical difficulty variance. Um, and again, the staff, this, the staff's position that this was a, more like a side wing was only because it didn't meet the 98 foot frontage requirement. It wasn't, we didn't, weren't even considering the dimensional requirements. It simply didn't meet that. So an estate wing couldn't happen there without something giving. And so that's why we called it a side wing. Um, it, it's, it's a bit challenging, um, but the designer has moved it back so that it does meet the side setback, a minimum of eight feet. He's showing 8.71 feet at the closest point of the structure for that second story addition on the garage. The garage itself is closer than that. So they're meeting setbacks with all the new construction, um, as Mr. Wilson said. Um, and aside from that, I think it's, it's basically in the board's hands to decide if they meet the criteria um, of the practical difficulty variance. Thank you. And can I ask one, one question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think you said that um, it's called a side wing, not a state wing. I think they're calling it a state wing, not a side wing. Right. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. And Mr. Wilson had, had mentioned that we, our argument was it was a side wing, and my statement was just we had no other choice because gotcha. it couldn't be in a state wing on a 75 foot okay. wide lot. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, just for the records, for people that know, Ms. Longstaff provides very, very comprehensive uh, documents to us ahead of time. However, I like to get that information on the record so it's not, uh, so I've understood that we, we've read a lot of this, but it's very thorough and I want to make sure it's open to the public. And it also helps clarify things as we go along. <coughs> um, this, Brian, the building is now a garage. At Yes, the side building is now a garage. The actually, and what they want to do is they want to put a second floor on it, and once they do that, that's when it becomes an estate wing. Um, 
I mean, the garage is there, so the garage is grandfathered. The garage is yeah. there. Yeah. The grandfathered exactly right. non-conforming garage, but by adding the second floor to it under the estate wing, the definition of a estate wing is a multi-storied addition. So by putting the bedrooms over it, you make it a multi-story, then it classifies as an estate wing. Okay. And and one, one thing I do appreciate that you have done is you were out of compliance by, a, was it 1.3 feet or something like that? And they are now within compliance by uh, 0.7 feet. Yeah. So they moved it inboard, which is great. Thank so you. Now is that on the overhang too? I know sometimes we look at the overhang. That's the overhang on the roof is still that distance as well. Yeah, the overhang will be back also. Yeah. Okay. Any boy comments? Should we jump right into the uh, requirements? Why don't we go right to the requirements? Uh, the this is going to be under the practical difficulty variance, which actually brings us to the uh, requirements as follows. One thing I've noticed, Mr. Chairman, is when we discuss the character code, there are terminologies that I keep using that come from the character code, which maybe the board isn't understand what the character code definition is for like engage porch, projecting porch, the state wing, side wing, all this new terminology that comes out of this character ordinance. As, so, as I know you and Mr. Longstaff have spent a lot of time working together on these things and, and the language is totally different yeah. than what we're used to seeing. Um, you're right. The amount of time that you, you're going to obviously have a much higher understanding of the individual words it helps when you explain it uh, because it is uh, I've never heard of a state wing until we saw this program. Right. Um, but there will be a quiz after that. And the more complicated part about it is each one of these little components all have different criteria as far as size based on what the existing base of the house is. So it, uh, uh, an estate wing on this house might be 32 by 32 but an estate wing on another house might be 24 by 24. And it all depends on the size of the base of the house. The new changes, as much as I like them, are challenging for me. Um, so the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. The property is 75 feet by 100 feet in size and approved a two-story home that is 28, 24 foot 8 by 32. The attached Attached to the princi uh, principal structure is an existing one-story garage, 20 foot 7 by 22. The existing one-story attached garage was constructed prior to the establishment of the CDC L1 character-based district, which does not allow this type of component. In other words, you can't have a garage attached to the house. The owner proposed to vertically expand the existing garage wing. This expansion would then be prescribed within the prescribed footprint of a two-story estate wing that is permitted in the CDCR1 zone. The proposal also includes a rear engaged porch entry and a rear addition that meets the requirements of the ordinance. The proposed components are all within the allowable building setbacks of the zone. The need for a variance is due to the minimum frontage on Ocean Avenue. The frontage requirement for a lot within the state wing is 98 feet. The proposed additions would meet all other requirements that are imposed on the property. The Higgins Beach area was created mostly with 50-foot wide lots as a norm. This property is 75 feet. On this 75-foot wide property, all the dimensional standards are satisfied except the street frontage, and we need a variance of uh, um, 23 feet on the street frontage. Okay, thank you. The granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair value, market value of abutting properties. The granting of the variance will allow the owner to vertically expand over the existing non-conforming garage, which then will create a structure that meets the dimensional standards of an estate wing. The existing non-conforming one-story garage structure will be incorporated within the two-story wing that is compliant with the character-based zoning requirements, and as such will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood that was envisioned by the ordinance. The proposal will not have an unreasonable detrimental effect on either the use of the fair market value of budding properties, and the proposed additions do not encroach on front side rear setback dimensions of the zone. 
And the practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or the prior owner. Well, if you remember, this project was previously presented to the ZBA in 2009. Uh, I believe Mark, you were chairman then, too. At that time, it was included, <laughs> it also included the addition of a front porch as well as the vertical expansion above the garage and the rear addition. The ZBA granted approval for the front and the front porch was construction, constructed. The remaining work was not built. In the interim, the, the CDCR1 district was established. The owner would like now to build the previously approved additions, but now the project must be, meet the standards of the CDCR1 zone. The character-based ordinance set forth dimensional and building component requirements that affect the property. The additions that are proposed meet all those requirements, and the street frontage requirement of 98 feet was imposed on the property, and therefore creating the uh, need for a variance. Just a little footnote there. When we came in in 2009, one of the big concerns the, the board had was putting the front porch along the front of the house because it needed a variance. Well, today that would be a permitted thing under the character ordinance, and we'd be more concerned about the what we are with the rear addition, where back then we were a little concerned about the rear addition and more about the porch. <laughs> Is that all that? Uh, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. It is, dimension, it is dimensionally possible you know, to create a rear addition to the existing building that would not require a variance, a dimensionally problem. This would not be a feasible alternative because of the floor plan of the existing house. The existing bathrooms on the first and second floor are located on the rear wall of the building. If this was where the addition went instead of over the garage, that's what I'm talking about. On the floor plan, if you look at it, the bathrooms are along the whole back wall on the second floor, and in the middle is the bathroom on the first floor. And if you put the addition on, on there, you'd have to reconstruct all those bathrooms in order to get access to the addition on the second floor and on the first floor. Um, by putting it where we're showing, over here, nothing in the main house has to be changed at all, except on the first floor, putting the uh, access from the kitchen to the back. So that would amount in a... Um, um, a total existing cost of three bathrooms, ten, fifteen thousand apiece, new walls, new flooring, new wiring. Um, all that would have to take place if we located it here, and um, so we didn't. Um, and like I say in the, in the letter, the existing bathrooms on the first floor and the second floor would need to be relocated. The interior walls would have to be reconstructed. The existing heating system, electrical lines would need to be changed, and the existing wood floors would need to be replaced, and so forth. The proposed addition does not require any of this to be done in the existing home to remain as is except for the kitchen wall. The rear addition approach would create a very undesirable and impractical alcove. That would be in this area if we put a rear addition on that didn't require a variance in the rear of the building between the garage and the existing house, and that would be a detriment to the use of the well-kept rear guard and the architectural aesthetics of the building if we went out here with a, uh, a big two-story wing in the back of the house versus the addition now in the back of the house is a one-story addition. So the pro proposal before the board utilizes the existing garage for the second floor area and keeps the kitchen expansion at a one-story addition. This approach allows the applicant best use of the yard, limits the total building mass of the two-story rear addition, and the additional <coughs> expenses to renovate the existing building. The only feasible alternative is a variance for the frontage of the property to allow the building to be constructed as shown. And the granting of variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Uh, the granting of the variance will allow the owner to expand his residence on the 75-foot wide lot will eliminate the existing non-conforming one-story attached garage by including it within the permitted two-story estate wing. The first floor kitchen expansion will be located next to the estate wing, uh, that's the existing garage, which will allow the direct access from the garage through the entry into the mudroom. 
The proposed location will retain much of the rear yard space and maintain the existing first floor living room patio door for access to the rear yard. Uh, if a variance is not granted, the existing non-conforming garage will remain and the owner would have to construct a two-story addition in the middle of the building under a rear addition, which would be problematic to the site, to the owner's pocketbook, and to the floor plan of the house. So we're proposing the plan we are to satisfy that. And the granting of the variance will not uh, have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment? No. And then, uh, the next two are, oops, sorry, uh, property is not located in part, uh, in the whole or in part within the shoreland zone as defined 38 MRSA S435 <coughs> uh, or flood hazard zone is defined in the Town Scarborough Flood Plain Management Ordinance. Nope, it's not. Okay, and then the practical difficulty, uh, just dimensional standards, those provisions of the ordinance which state to a lot area, lot coverage, frontage, and setback, including buffer requirements. And uh, the next step question is, or statement that needs to be addressed is the case where the strict application of dimensional standards of the up ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in a significant economic injury to the applicant. Uh, in the Higgins Beach character district, the existing one-story attached garage is a is not a permitted component that's allowed. So therefore, it's non-conforming. The, the, the garage is a pre-existing non-conforming structure. The vertical expansion above the garage changes the designation into a conforming two-story estate wing, which is permitted component in the district. The proposed addition and expansion meet the building setbacks that are imposed by the zoning and do not need a variance for location on the lot. However, the property has a street frontage of 75 and it requires 98 feet in the ordinance. A case with a strict application of the dimensional standards, street frontage of the ordinance, would preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone. So by adding the second story over the garage and the permitted uh, um, expansion to the rear, all those are permitted uses in the zone. And um, the street frontage preclude that permitted use from happening without a variance. In order to expand the residence, the plan showed the most desirable location, both, both from an architectural and a financial standpoint. The floor plan of the existing house is laid out with bathrooms at the rear wall. If a rear addition was added to the house, which did not require a variance, the first and second floors would need to be completely remodeled in order to have access to the expanded areas. The result would be a significant increase in construction costs. A two-story addition would need to be a minimum of 22 by 24 feet, uh, which would include two bedrooms, bathroom, and closets. This rear addition would also disturb the area <coughs> in the rear yard and create a three-sided dead zone between the house and the existing garage. By utilizing the existing garage as part of the expansion, the interior of the existing home can be left as is and the owner can avoid any significant economic injury that would otherwise result if a variance was not granted in the reduction of street frontage. Thank you. Okay, I'll come back to the board for questions. Comments? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Wilson, when was the uh, original structure and garage built? <clears throat> uh, right after World War II. I'm saying late 40s, very okay. the latest 51, maybe. You said 61 or 51? 61. <coughs> now the diagram you have on there that you had gone over, if you did do what's, the, what's in there in the red, would that have any impact that you'd have to come from zoning board for? No, it wouldn't, but it would entail a vast more expenditures of money to put it there because of the floor plan of the building. Um, and also because of the mass of the building. It would have to be a two-story. This would be two stories high and sticking behind the two-story building, whereas um, where we propose to do it, it would just be uh, over the existing garage and the rest of the addition in the rear is all one story. So the mass of the building is a lot less. It would look more pleasant instead of sticking in the middle of the building. And also the cost of doing it 
by putting it where we're showing. If you look at the floor plan on the uh, building, you will see what I'm talking about. Um, on the second floor is bathrooms all through here. And we have the addition, you have to get to the addition, we have to relocate all those bathrooms and re reframe it and replumb it. And um, they would lose access from the living room out the rear door to the yard if we put the addition right in the middle. They yeah, all I that. wanted to know was if there was a feasible alternative. That was the only question. So it's an alternative, but nowhere near feasible. Is, is that a sewer property? What's that? Is that public sewer? Thank yes. Can we come back to Mr. Crockett's statement? One of the things I need to get clarified is the last section where it says, uh, a case with a strict application of dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which the variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone, uh, which it is in in located, and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. Mm -hmm. My understanding, and Mr. Longstaff, if you can help me out with this, the dimensional issue is the front that's causing this issue in this category? Yes. The, the, what the applicant is proposing for an addition would most, most um, closely resemble an estate wing. An estate wing can only happen on a lot with 98 feet, uh, at least 98 feet of street frontage. This lot has 75. He, he's gone on to explain why they're proposing what they're proposing as opposed to putting it in the back of a house and just leaving the garage alone. It, in, it, you know, his argument is that it, it then sort of converts the garage, which is a non-conforming piece of the existing house, into a conforming piece of the existing house, except for the fact that the lot still only has 75 feet. So that's why they're, that, that's the relief that they're asking for. The other arguments, uh, the other testimony that he's giving is for the board's ability to decide and determine whether or not it is truly um, financially, uh, a financial hardship or, you know, unfeasible to, to do anything different. I've, I've got up on the screen, just, just to save you leafing through your information, what you're looking at right now is the, on the sort of left hand side is the existing bathrooms that he's talking about. You can see the stairway that goes upstairs. In order to access an addition out the back, which would be at the top of the page there, you'd have to somehow have access through one of those bathrooms or down the hall. Something would have to give. You'd lose something there. By doing all of the construction as he's proposed, what he's telling the board is that you preserve all of the existing structure. You don't have to go in and, and demo anything or relocate any plumbing. And that's the, the cost that he's trying, the argument, and it's your job to determine if that's, uh, uh, you know, if he's making his point there. Okay. Do you agree that this, I think you said this already in your, in your memo, but you do classify this as it sits as a, what are we calling it? A state, state, wing? state as a you feel comfortable with that definition? It, as proposed, the, the, again, the dimensions of it most closely resemble an estate wing. I cannot call it an estate wing <laughs> because the lot is not 98 feet wide. Perfect. Thank you. Once you say, yeah, 75 feet is okay, if you say that, then it becomes an estate wing and it is compliant mm -hmm. in every other sense of the word. Thank you. Um, you? Sorry. No, I was going to say, I think it's important to clarify that if, I mean, I think it's a big decision to say that anyone who has 75 foot frontage, we are now going to call this an estate wing. Um, so I think that's something to consider is how this relates down the road. Mm -hmm. why, why can't you just call it an addition on the side? The, the <clears throat> there are some dimensional requirements, min minimums and maximums for an addition on the side. You either have the side wing, which can be one or two stories, but it, the dimensions change. If you go two stories, you can only do it to half the width of, or a third, excuse me, a third of the width of the front of the house. That's to kind of keep everything in scale. Um, if you go one story, you can go half the width of the house so you can have a little bit wider um, addition and then you basically can go out as far as the setback allows 
with the estate wing, it, you know, in a larger lot, the whole idea is on a larger lot, the scale can be bigger. And the estate wing allows you that, that opportunity to have a bigger side wing called an estate wing. You know, I'm really surprised that we passed this <coughs> because there are so few lots down there that are greater than 50 feet in width. And now you're saying an estate wing has got to be 98 feet in width? He didn't, he didn't do it. <laughs> Again, you have to go, you have to, I don't want to get into the weeds too far, Ed, but you remember we had the charrette. We, we had a public meeting. We went through all of the massing, all of the height. <coughs> this thing was studied to death, and, and exactly as you just said, there are very few houses, or excuse me, very few lots that have 98 feet of width. That's why the estate wing is only allowed on those. The other lots, the smaller, narrower lots, it would look out of place. You don't even have the room to put an estate wing in there. This is, as Mr. Doherty explained, this is sort of in the middle. It's not a 50 foot, it's not a 98 foot. They already have a garage. And that, to Ms. Shoup's point, would be sort of the, the qualifier there, if you will. It, it would be the difference maker between somebody else with a 75 foot lot coming in and saying, I want to just put a and a state wing there. There's already a structure in place on this lot. So, you know, just to just to kind of separate it from every other 70 foot, five foot lot, which there aren't very many um, at Higgins Beach anyway. But if, <coughs> if the garage is already grandfathered as being there, why can't you just put a second floor on the garage? Any, any new addition that you put on the house now has to meet the character code. You can't just willy-nilly throw stuff on an existing structure and say, ah, it's already, it, this is a new, this we've is a already, We've already approved second floor additions to houses down there. So this, the challenge what's is, the difference here? Yeah, the challenge is that the, the, what we did in the past, like, like you said, I've been here since well, well before 2009, um, but that being said, is those are the old rules, these are the new rules. So what you and I have done over the years, because you both and I have been on the board for a no, long no, time. No, no, I'm talking about recently. Yeah, yeah. so the, the additions that we've approved, if they've come to the board, they've asked for some relief in some form. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. And you've granted that. And that's allowed them to do it. Once they get that relief, and it's got to be a dimensional relief of some sort, a setback uh, or something, that addition has to meet the code. And Walt's been in that in that position where he's had to design for a vertical addition to a house and that has to meet code. The dormers have to meet the code, the windows, the fenestration, it all has to meet. I know it's I know it's 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 a lot <laughs> to, to wrap your head around, but if you're looking at it, they're asking for relief for something. And in nine times out of ten that's going to be a dimensional issue, a setback a lot frontage, a lot area, something. And so if you grant them that, then that has to meet the code. Other board members, comments? Mr. Wilson, could you expand on the costs related to building straight off the back on the left? Could you uh, give me more information on what those costs would be? Oh, if we did it in here Correct. instead? <laughs> okay, right off the back, there's, there's three bathrooms that are affected, two on the second one on the first. They've got to be ripped out, replumbed, reframed, and relocated in order to get access to the rear building. There's also an additional cost, of course, in the, uh, the size of the foundation because we aren't using the existing garage foundation for about half of the space. Um, then you've got hardwood floors have to be redone on the second floor because it's all hardwood floors up there. You take a wall out, you gotta you got to patch the floor. And you aren't going to just patch it. You've got to rip it up and replace it so it looks right. Um, all said and done, you're looking at an easy 10, well, probably two of the bathrooms would be close to 15000 apiece. The one on the first floor would probably be, once you did the opening and the passage through, would probably be close to ten. The reframing of the walls up on the second floor and re-sheet rocking and wood floors, you're probably looking at another 10,000 involved for all that. And so you're looking at, um, what that up to? 45-ish. Uh, about 45-ish, yeah. 50,000. Okay. That would not have to be incurred if the board approves the variance so the addition can be placed where it is. Okay. 
Thank which you. is the significant increase in cost without the variance. Thank you. Other board members comments? Okay. So uh, my greatest issue was, in fact, the last section. Uh, and I do think you've answered that sufficient for me. I, I would think of having recently done something like this, it's very expensive. To, it's almost as expensive to disassemble everything as it is to put it back together. So I understand that. I think the logic you use is sound. I think the argument and the presentation and the way you worked with the town is reasonable. Um, I think it's, it's, it certainly brings it as more, conform, more conformity. You've got uh, the person on the left-hand side being very pleased with it and glad that they're doing it, um, the Vashon family. You've got the people on the right. We don't have any comments from them, do we? Nothing in written. It's just a verbal I talk to them, and I know that's for third party hearsay, so I don't think but, I But again, it has minimal impact on them because the, the, the they, garage they weren't complaining is going up, so I can't see why they'd have a problem. Uh, I, I think you've done a good job with it overall. I, I don't have a problem uh, with supporting this. I think it meets it. Um, I also think realistically from the road, the only major change is you're going to see a, uh, a, an attractive uh, dormer. On the, on the front, right? That's really the only difference. Am I right about that? The only thing. Every, everything else is meets all the restrictions, setbacks, everything. It's just the frontage. And plus, it makes the non conforming garage conforming by like going two stories. Uh, one more question, Mr. Wilson. Uh, if you were to look several properties to the right, several properties to the left, and across the street, several properties either way, are there any other homes that have an attached garage? One right next door on the left. Okay. Is that the only one? The one across the street? Right. Okay. Up at that end of, 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 of Ocean by the intersection where Greenwood comes across, yeah. many of the houses on Greenwood in that intersection have garages. If you went down there to look, you'd see several of them. Attached garages? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just those were built earlier and more residential type house than what the other ones were. Okay. You brought up a very good point, Ms. Shoup, and I want to make sure that that's covered. Well, first, I'm just, it's one of the requirements is no other feasible alternative. I think my question to the board is, is, an al is another alternative to not do anything? I think that's always an alternative. Okay. Right. Right, because this is not a situation where his house is dilapidated. He has to replace it. He needs to put it on piling. This is just he wants to put this on. Right. Okay. And so there's and no other alternative to the design and the expansion that he wants to do. Right. I would, I would feasible. Say, feasible alternative. Yeah. When, when, when you have, you always have a do nothing, right? Unless the thing's going to fall down. Right. That's always the alternative. But I don't think we, kind of focus on that. It's what are the alternatives that they can do to try and keep it in compliance. I think not what makes me uncomfortable is they presented the full application as an estate wing, but it's not an estate wing um, under, under the rule, under the ordinance. Um, we're trying to fit it into an ordinance. So the whole application says this is in compliance with an estate wing. They're saying make, let this be an estate wing. And I think what sits wrong with me is, you know, the next person down the street who has a 74-foot frontage who wants an estate wing or a 60-foot frontage. I think we have to decide where you kind of differentiate and put a point and say, okay, you know, you need that frontage. I mean, clearly the town said 98 feet, not 100, not 75, not 80. They said 98 for a reason. Um, and so I think that's just something that I'm struggling with. And I think that, that goes really speaks strongly to the character, right? It, one of the reasons why they wanted a 90 foot, 98 foot frontage is so it doesn't seem like a huge mass down near the road. Right. And it doesn't take the full width of the property, in my opinion. Right. Is, is that true? Mm. So I think if, it, if we feel it still meets the character, and it's not absorbing the whole property, then it kind of, in my opinion, passes. That is why that's I asked the, the question. Impact. That's exactly why I asked the question about really the only impact is the dormer on the front. Right. So, and I, a couple of things here. With a practical difficulty variance, we have a little bit of freedom to use more wiggle room, but it doesn't preclude us from having to hold ourselves accountable to the, the, the cost issue which you bring up. Um, and let me read it again just to make sure that we're all on the same page because I think it's important. Uh, although I, I do want to make sure everybody understands that what we do today has nothing to do with what we do tomorrow, ever. 
other than our goal as a board to be consistent. And but there's nobody the board's voting on one thing. There are always variables that affect everything. So each one stands on their own. They don't stand on the, the precedent of the board's previous votes, which is really important to understand. That being said, we do want to be ethical and consistent. So what you're bringing up is accurate. Um, a case where the strict application of dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which the variance is sought would both, and this is where I think your questions come, preclude the use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in the significant economic injury to the applicant. So I think, and this may need to be more clarification because what you said, I do think they've made a decent argument for the cost. I don't have a problem with that. I think they've also made a decent argument for the fact that it is more in, you know, in compliance because it's actually it's not a requirement in this section, but um, it actually fits the mold and the goal of the town. However, the next piece is um, uh, preclude the use of the property which is permitted in the zone. So then the question is, okay, what do they currently have? And can they use it to a reasonable extent as it currently sits uh, without doing anything? And I think that's a fair question. What do the board think of that? Or do they agree with me on that one? Well, the only, the only thing that's kind of, like Ms. Shoup said, is we're looking at this and we're labeling it as state wing according to the appeal. The zoning officer has told us it's not in a state wing. It's not big enough. It's a side wing. So well, we either redefine it or we don't. Can I, I don't want to put words in Ms. Longstead's mouth. I don't, I'll see. Well, no, I'm not, the, the, the appellant isn't wrong in saying that dimensionally it meets the estate wing dimensions. No. I want to be clear on that. Right. That's their argument, is that it mirrors an estate wing except for the 75 foot frontage. Right. That's where you guys come in. Right. <laughs> and that's why it's in the practical You business. say, okay, yeah, we'll <laughs> grant you relief on that 98-foot requirement, then it's in a statement. I don't want to, I'm not trying to mince words or create confusion. You call it something, Ed calls it a side, a, an addition. <laughs> that's fine. We, we, we happen to name it in a state wing just to differentiate it between some other type of addition. It's just words. It's the issue in front of the board is the relief on the 70, uh, on the 98 foot front. That's, I don't, I mean, how do I, I, don't, I with all due respect, I don't make it harder than it has to be. Concentrate on that. Have they met the standards in the, in the ordinance for a practical difficulty? That's all you really need to concern yourself with. And then all the questions are good. It's always good. I'm not tra saying that. Just don't, don't get into areas that don't address those criteria. And that maybe keeps it simpler for you to make those types of determinations, and they're not not easy to make. And, and tied to that, I think this is again, this is my opinion, but practical difficulty variance is used intentionally, and practical is very different than strict adherence. Where we we're doing a variance, it's strict adherence to, whereas practical difficulty means I think exactly that. Is it practically reasonable to say, okay, this is really, and this is all I'm looking at, from a visual point of view, which is obviously the intent, or my belief of the intent of the ordinance change, it doesn't change a thing. It's practical. It gets the home to being you know, a wonderful home. I think that works well. I don't think there's anything wrong with a home previously, but that's not a requirement. But the question is, is it dramatically more expensive to you? Could they do something? They've got a big building involved. So they could do a lot of different things. But is it reasonable when there's a, there's a vehicle already in place specifically designed for a situation other than the fact that it isn't 75 feet? That fits perfectly. So to, to me, with the work they've done, both parties, the town and, and uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, they've done a good job taking something that doesn't fit nice and neat and make it nice and neat. And then I might add, Mr. Chairman, too, um, and I know the board has sort of questioned this a time or two, but when an applicant comes with a project to me to discuss it, and I always look for what can you do that doesn't require the board's approval. That's the first question I ask. And Walt 
I beat him up on that many, many times. Yeah. Why are you bringing this to the board? Not because I don't <laughs> like you guys and I don't want to see you have something to do, but the first question is, is there a way to do what you, what you need without having to get a board's approval? So we usually look really hard at that. I won't say that, you, you know, everybody has the right to an appeal regardless of how ridiculous it may be. You have the right to, to, to file an appeal. But I do try to determine whether or not there's some other option available. And so kind of almost by default in many cases, we've kind of looked at the feasibility issue even before it gets to you. I won't say 100%, and I won't say that there isn't an argument one way or the other, but we've vetted that a little bit. Yeah, at least a little bit, and sometimes a lot, before it ever gets to you guys. And I just offer that as information. And tied to that, one of the things I look at when I read uh, Mr. Longstaff's comments is the first sentence every time. This, he doesn't say it every time, but it's always going to, when he does say it, it's going to be in the first sentence. This project and location makes it eligible for practical difficulty variance appeal. He's not saying it makes it approvable, but he's saying that it's the right vehicle to be, to be used, and I think that's important. It doesn't mean I'm going to say yes because of that, but I do feel confident that, that the, the homework has already been done <coughs> for us on whether or not it fits the box. Then it comes down to being whether or not we're comfortable with the rest of it. Do you want a motion to go over the questions? Well, let's go with the uh, questions first and we'll with the motion. Um, uh, the need for the variance is due to the unique uh, circumstance of the property and not to the uh, general conditions in the neighborhood. Are you okay with the setting you're in? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's character-based coding. They're going by what they see and trying to make it look like what's down there, even though the dimensions aren't the same. So I don't see a problem with that. Mr. Chair, can I make a suggestion? Can sure. you work opposite side to give them a chance to speak instead of them just saying, <laughs> I agree with that? I just like, I just like putting them on the spot. Sure, Ms. Shoup, would you like to jump in? <laughs> well, I like saying that. Um, I think the applicant has done a good job demonstrating, you know, the unique circumstances of the property, and um, I think they're trying to be non. I think they're kind of using this to their advantage, the garage, and trying to make it more conforming with this estate wing proposal. Yeah, the property is only 70 feet wide. You need 98. That's everything else is is there. So I'm in agreement with it. And I'm agreeing with as well. I think the, the appellant has uh, has done a, has a good job of uh, justifying what they need to do under these unique circumstances based on the character-based code, um, and then, as indicated, brings it into more conformance by doing this. I agree with that as well. And I think with a 75-foot frontage and an attached garage, that makes it unique to this pr property. And I know there are other properties that have attached garages, but I don't know if they're 75 foot uh, or 100, so I would suspect that makes it unique to this property. Would you like to already have mine? Uh, the uh, needs of variance to do the unique circumstance of the property, not the general conditions of the neighborhood. I agree. Um, <laughs> all in favor, that <laughs> one is met. <laughs> uh, opposed, none. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not result, uh, will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the uh, use or fair market value of the abutting property. Ms. Shoup, would you like to do that well, one? I mean, up? clearly everyone in Higgins Beach is conforming to the character-based zones there, so they're trying to come up to that, and, um, you know, they're just trying to be in conformance, and it's going to improve the value, and from what it sounds like, the neighboring properties have the same sort of garages with living above. Yeah, the, uh, what they want to do is all acceptable through the character based other than the lot width. So uh, if it's acceptable, it's okay with the neighborhood. I'm in, uh, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement as well. Um, building on what Ms. Shoup stated uh, and what the applicant also indicated that the um, house across the street and then adjacent down the road they also have garages and then the neighboring street also has garages there so this isn't really going <coughs> to it's not going to irrevocably change anything in this neighborhood adding to this uh, looking at the new roof line for the 
uh, expansion over the garage is only at 24 foot 7. They could have been much more liberal in trying to take more roof line or a higher roof, roof line. So I think that helps it fit within the character. They're adding in one story onto an existing envelope, only on the garage side. So from a character standpoint, I don't think it adds a, a lot of mass. So I still think that helps uh, support it in its uh, statement that it's going to not change the character of the neighborhood. Um, calling it an estate versus a wing or whatever you want to call it doesn't matter. Um, again, it's not too much mass, and looking at the design, it does fit within the character. Yeah, it's it's basically going within the character base, voting down there, zoning down there, and they're making it similar to other ones that are there that may be a little bit bigger. Uh, you had an off-the-cuff conversation with someone on something else, and they said that they actually approved of the look of it. So, uh, yeah, I have a lot. I know Karen uh, Vashon very well. I wanted it on the public record that I'd talk with her, and she was very supportive. And she's directly next door, and she's a year-round resident too, which is, to me, gives it a little bit more weight. But it's still more than many, Mr. Chair. It isn't, but you can trust me. Well, well. You trust me, I'm not That's like the other two. Any of the variants is not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use of the fair market value of the pro budding properties. I think it's consistent with what we're doing. I think it's consistent with the character based plan. Everybody seems to be comfortable with it. The only issue we're really dealing with is a uh, 15 foot question. Is that the number? 23. So. That's it. I'm fine with this, and I think it works well. All in favor of B, B, uh, two meeting that? James, thank you. The practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or the prior owner. And shoot, I think you still up to bat based on uh, Mr. Lazell's rules. Um, so, I mean, they've explained to us that apparently this is already approved in 2009. So, I mean, I think it's not their fault that in the interim, the zoning laws and ordinances have since changed, which has now precluded something that was allowed before. So I don't think it was their action. Very obvious it's not their action. I agree with the shoe, but I have nothing to add to that. Structure being built in 1961 proves that it's not their issue. Yeah, I don't think it's their issue. I don't. I don't know if we established whether the former appeal was approved or denied. I can't. Oh, back in back in, in 2009, it was approved. It was approved. It was approved. It was not finished, correct. <coughs> approved and just never followed up on. Yeah. They did the front porch, which was part of a, the approval. And uh, the practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. I agree with uh, what's been said. All in favor of being that. Thank you. Four, no other feasible alternatives available to the applicant except the variance. Well, I think Brian gave a really good explanation that he kind of goes through the applicants and brings them to this point where there really is no feasible alternative for the project that they're proposing. There was a lot of discussion about putting an addition on the back and how much costly it would be. And, uh, I think this is, they're doing the right thing. I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement as well. I think the other feasible alternatives were exercised and, or at least exercised theoretically and came to the conclusion that this is the most feasible alternative for them. I agree. <coughs> I think the uh, 45000 additional cost to do those modifications seems like a reasonable number. Three bathrooms needing to be modified, utilities relocation, as well as potential flooring needing to be modified. So I think they did their due diligence in looking at a feasible alternative that was available to them, and I agree with this. There are no uh, no other feasible alternatives except for doing this. You know how I'm going to go with this. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking right at it on the, on the map. There's a feasible alternative. No. That's, it's, it's drawn could you, in. Could you mean if you can just because I do know where you're going, because you say it a little bit more, more directly. Yeah, I mean, what it says is it doesn't say if there's any other feasible alternative or the best feasible alternative. It says no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. I'm looking right at the design there. There's a feasible alternative sitting right there. But it comes it to doesn't, cost. It, it doesn't say. Uh, it doesn't say just the board. It doesn't say cost. It doesn't say anything. We get down to that in B2. Okay, so uh, all in favor of uh, 
What number is that? Six? Four. Four. Are you going to comment on this, Mr. Chair? Uh, I'll be candid with you. I'm sorry. Um, I think you make a good point uh, with your argument. I, I see it differently, but I respect it from where you're coming from. And actually, I, uh, you're consistent. Uh, I've, you're very consistent on that. You, uh, I respect that. And uh, I think the reason I asked for it to clarify is because sometimes when you do say those things, I fall back and go, wait a minute, he's right. I do need to look at it that way. So thank you. I, I still support um, my definition of it tied in with, um, and maybe I'm adding some to it, but I think it gives us a little bit more freedom than, than what it's set up with. So all in favor of four being met? And that's and oppo opposed? One. One. one opposed. This. Next one is the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Well, again, we talked about how the other properties in the neighborhood have the garages with the living space above them, and um, if we fit them into this estate wing sort of thing, the putting the rooms over the garage will make the garage in conformance. The granting of the variance will bring it into conformance with the new character base zoning, not necessarily <laughs> the neighborhood. I couldn't hear what was that. I said not necessarily the neighborhood. <laughs> sure. But I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement. Of, I am in agreement as well, um, including the second story on this estate wing. Um, brings it a little bit more into conformance. Um, that's it. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, taking the right rear from... 6.71 from the property line to 8.71 feet brings it more in compliance and improves. Yes, I'd agree that basically it's conforming it better with giving more space. We're always looking for that. Aesthetically wise, it's probably going to be the same. Appearance wise, it's going to be very similar to stuff down there. I mean, the character based on is what it is. It's there for a reason. And again, the uh, granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Um, I would tend to agree with that based on, actually, I think you made a good observation, Mr. Blaze made a good observation, not necessarily with the surrounding properties, but where the surrounding properties are going because of the new requirements. I think it's, uh, it's probably one of the earlier ones that's moving us in that direction. So that's why I support it. So all in favor of five being met? Opposed? None? Uh, 6.71 in the right rear with a setback of 8 feet. And under the new layout, it's going to be 8.71 feet from the right. So it's in conformance. And the front corner of the garage was 8.67, which was in compliance, and now goes to 10.67. So it's more in compliance. Right. Uh, right front. Is 10.67 no. under the new design? Oh, oh sorry. yeah. And 8.7 in the right rear, and the side setback is 8 feet. What the catch it? I do. His details are amazing. The granting of the variance will not uh, have an adverse effect on the natural environment. No. No. <laughs> no. Great. Did I answer that? Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. Did you do a study on whether or not there are any uh, typing <laughs> floggers there? <laughs> just, just making a joke. I have no problem with it. I think. There's no pluggers here. No pluggers. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. so all in favor of 16 minutes? That's your name. Thank you. And then the property is not in Shoreland Zone. I, nope. I abbreviated it. No. no. Not yet. <laughs> oh, David, this is a mess. <laughs> That's unanimous. And the last two, and again, I think the most important, as we've learned, uh, the case where the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the eight property for which the variance is sought would both preclude the use of the property, which is permanently in the zone, in which it is located, and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. 
And I'll start with Ms. Shoup. I think it's interesting that the two ends here are going to have a much more similar point of view on this. So Ms. Shoup, we'll start with you. Um, well, if we let them be in a state wing, it's, um, it's a use that's allowed. I mean, wow. Let me regroup there. <laughs> Why don't we start with Ed? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go back to the original uh, purpose of this is to accept or approve a building that meets all of the character-based zoning requirements other than the fact that it's not on a lot that's 98 feet wide. So everything is there. I'm in agreement with shortening the width of the lot down to 75, period. All right. I think the uniqueness of this is because it's between 50 and 98 feet wide. Um, that's sort of the, the sort of nebulous area that we're trying to define as our role as the board. I think characterizing this as the estate wing and then with the uh, improvements or rather alterations to the home that will uh, bring it more in compliance with being a estate wing of the house, um, I think that's perfectly reasonable. I think by approving this, we, we I, I'm looking at the financial side and the number of $45,000 for the feasible alternative. I think if we were to force them in that direction, I think that's undue hardship from a financial standpoint. Looking at the value of the property, I don't know what it is, but I would imagine the structure is value is not worth more than 300000 or so, so adding 45000 to construction is more than 15, maybe 20% of the value of the home. So I think that's putting undue hardship. So I, I would agree with uh, approving this so that they don't have that undue hardship. Are you looking for B1 and 2 together? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, normally if you say there's no feasible alternative, you would vote no on this. I do appreciate your question of asking what the repair bills would be or what the cost would be is 45000 I can see it on B2. I can't see it on no feasible alternative because it's not spelled out for me on no feasible alternative. If it said the best feasible alternative, I could vote yes on that, but I can't. I can say on this one, though, that I do believe it is an undue hardship for that amount, but I still have to hold true to the four as well. Sure. Thank you. And regarding the uh, question of uh, the case with strict application of mental standards of the ordinance uh, to the property with the various sought would both preclude the use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. I uh, actually agree with Mr. Blaze. Uh, I think he summed it perfectly for me. So uh, thanks. All in favor of uh, section B1 and 2 being that. That's unanimous. Okay. Do you have a motion on the uh, entire? Move to appeal. Appeal. Move to approve appeal <laughs> number 26. <laughs> 16 as presented. Second. And discussion on the motion? Seeing none on favor. All opposed? One opposed? Thank you very much. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to say one thing. When we go through the Higgins Beach, the character stuff, it's like Brian was saying. Some cases, I've had three or four meetings with Brian to get things to fit the character code definitions. And he'll write me a letter that the application is incomplete in certain things. So we go through a lot of that. Unlike a person coming in, for example, that wanted to have a variance to put a garage who lives out in the rural section, he doesn't have that usually face-to-face -face discussion of what all the, the codes require. And he comes into the board, and the board is then able to look at it. Well, did you look at this? Did you look at that? Have you considered this? Well, going through Brian in the character code, we've already done all that. So, you know, so it's a little different approach when you come into the zoning board because the zoning board should recognize that Brian has gone through a lot of this stuff, and it should be in the package. I think what's yes, important to note is that you, you deal with very, very complex processes as opposed to adding a garage in a, in a <laughs> RF zone. Um, so I don't disagree with you, I think, but again, it's, that's part of Mr. Longstaff's responsibility, which he does very well. I think part of your credibility and the reason why you get most of your things approved is because you work very well with him. I don't know what happened. 
closed doors with anybody. <laughs> I work well. <laughs> but, but, but to add to that, too, Mr. Chair, we take the town's opinion and consider it, yep. but that doesn't help us decide. We don't have to decide on our own. So whether he went through it with you or not, if we felt differently, we'd have to vote differently. I'm usually talking about dimensional stuff on, on these additions and components. Yeah. You know, we have a certain thing by the ordinance you have to maintain. You guys don't get into that, but, you know, Right. So if a guy comes in and says, I want to put a 12 by 20 addition on, you guys look at it, well, to fit the dimension setbacks. Whereas with Brian and the character, we already approved We're you. looking Aren't at that. Aren't you done now? I'm just trying to <laughs> clarify. Give me, give me the feedback. We're just looking at that 12 by 20. may not fit the size required down there. You have the next appeal, too? Yeah. No, sir. You have the next appeal, too? Yeah. Nice to see you, Mr. Wilson. Congratulations on both. Gavel him down, please. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was pretty good. <laughs> I move to appeal, appeal. is a limited reduction of yard size request by Dominic Fortier, 8 Morning Street, this is map U2, parcel 125. <coughs> if you state your name and the address relationship, we'll go from there. Sure. My name is David Morris. I, have come, uh, I work at Caleb Johnson Studio in Portland. Um, I'm the architect for the project here on behalf of Ms. Fortier, my client. Okay. And if you'd like to state what you're trying to accomplish, sure. and uh, we'll go from there. Is it easier for me to? It's on the bottom. There you go. And did you say your last name was Morris? Morris. Yep. Um, we, w uh, the project that we're working on is at the corner of Morning Street and Bayview Avenue in Higgins Beach. The, the property and the lot itself is conforming from a dimensional standpoint, um, but the building itself, which was constructed, I believe, in 1952, 53-ish, um, and then renovated again in, in the early 90s, um, sits across the now required uh, setbacks uh, for the property. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the house itself or if you've seen photos, but um, it, is, it is clearly a building that has been added to over time. It was originally, I suspect, a one-story cottage that had a second floor addition or maybe several additions to the upwards and outwards. But it's, it's, it's kind of a, an odd, odd, uh, uh, odd structure architecturally. Uh, the, the relief that we're seeking is that along Bayview Avenue, the building sits about two feet four across the required setback. It also uh, sets, uh, I think it's, uh, it's like a foot, one foot eight across the setback on the side yard here as well. The project that we're looking to do is to expand the second floor. And the reason that we're here is, is, is really twofold, is that um, the, the current setback at the second floor would be two foot four in from the, the side uh, wall on the, on the first floor, um, which, which proposes a couple of problems for us because due to the internal circulation of the, of the building on the second floor, those interior spaces would be less than eight feet, or less than not just under nine feet in depth. So um, bedrooms at less than nine feet in width are functionally very difficult. Um, but even greater than that, um, I'll say that this has not been through a full administrative review with Mr. Longstaff from a character-based code um, perspective, but that's what we're trying to do. And we really feel that what we're looking to do is in this zone right here to seek relief so that we can build out to the wall at the first floor, and that would be about two foot four. Um, without that, we feel like it's going to be very difficult to meet the character-based standards for Higgins Beach for a house because of the regulations asking for a simple volume where the walls of, a, of the primary massing are in plane. Um, if we are not 
building out to the wall, we have a one-story wall, a two-foot roof, and then another second-story second vertical wall, which does not meet the character-based codes. Um, we're also doing something on the side yard where we're currently, at, I think it's one foot four across the required setback. And what we want to do is we want to retract the building in this zone. And we want to take away, and I don't know if you can see it or not, um, in this zone here we have some red stripe lines. We want to pull the building back closer to the setback. We want to turn this into a bay window so that it meets the character-based codes here again. And what we're seeking for is relief to have about four and a half to five and a half inches across the required setback to comply with the dimensions of a bay, which allows us a three-foot projection. So we're pulling the building back, um, but we're still seeking a little bit of relief from the current, uh, current setbacks. Um, the, the massing of the building, if, if you can see the elevations here, this zone right there is, this, uh, is the section that we're seeking relief. So that zone from this, from this point to this point. We're also seeking for that four and a half to five and a half inches right there along this portion of the building here. Very good. Thank you. Jumbled. I'm sorry. <laughs> very, very well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any letters on this or no. nothing? In this? Okay. Open the public hearing. Uh, doesn't look like we have anybody that wants to speak to the public. <laughs> the letters, no phone calls. I'll close the public hearing. Uh, come to this long staff. Anything you'd like to add with this? Um, I, th I think uh, Dave's done a good job of explaining it, but just to reiterate, um, if, if you look he's, uh, at his easel, the upper left-hand corner, I have that uh, view up on uh, the screen. No, I'm sorry, I've got a different view up on the screen. But the, the screen I've got is the north elevation. If you look at, if you can see the hand <laughs> on the cursor, this is what he's talking about. That would meet the setback. But that would create a wall plane that then sets in. And as, as David was mentioning, the character code wants a nice rectangular box, clean lines, not so many juts in. In fact, I'm really surprised in the last appeal that Walter didn't ask to line <laughs> those walls up. <laughs> but, 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 that, but he's a designer that likes to have very <laughs> wall lines, much to our dismay. So. <laughs> Uh, I think Caleb Johnson's architects are trying to meet the, the, the spirit of the code in trying to line walls up and make simple, plain, clean lines. But the setbacks, unfortunately, you know, they're working with an existing building. They're not taking that building away and starting over. So they're trying to work within the confines of the building. Long story short, the relief that they're asking for falls within the limited reduction of yard size parameters of, of the five foot side in, in rear setbacks uh, in, in they're asking for very minimal amounts of that up to five feet in order to line those walls up which again it, it's the proper vehicle the house meets the eligibility criteria and I think they've done a, a in my estimation they've done a very good job I'm, there's some elements of this I don't I don't uh, I'm not sure that I'm on board with but the lining up of the walls is definitely something that I think is they're, they're using the tools at their disposal to try to meet the code. I think it I think it works. And just for clarification, you've got control. If we approve this, you've got control of the remainder of the design. Standards. I still get to beat them up. Yep. Get to yep. Them up. yep. <laughs> Our clients will beat us up. And, <laughs> and did you say everybody gets beaten up in this problem? Uh, well, that's okay. Did you say four and a half to five and a half inches? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't think we've ever had one like that before. <laughs> And can I, can I make one other point, too? Is that okay? Thank sure, you. go ahead. Um, one other thing, one, one other uh, aspect, and it doesn't necessarily pertain to the relief we're seeking, but it does uh, show some of the, the, the strategies that we're making to really comply with the character-based codes is on the, um, on this portion of the house, we have a second story addition that is non-complying, sits over the setbacks um, that we really aren't allowed to manipulate in any way that makes it bigger, taller. Um, but what we're doing is we're actually going to take those roof eaves and we're going to drop them. Um, and that, that, that brings it down in line with 
or we're proposing to do that, brings it in line with the newer, lower eave heights for, for a house. So on the back in the nonconforming section here, again, we're, we're dropping, trying to make it smaller, trying to make it more in compliance with the character-based codes. Okay, great. Why don't we go through the requirements? Um, Quick question, Mr. Moon. So four and a half, five and a half inches on both sides. From, from, is that what you're saying? You've got one picture over there and one picture over here. So we have, uh, we're looking for about four and a half to five and a half inches on this side. Okay, what's that yellow you got there? This, this is the same as this, which is okay. about two feet four okay. inches. I didn't know if that was something else. It, this is just uh, the other side of the house. Okay. So uh, why don't we run right through the uh, requirements. I think this is pretty straightforward. I never know, but we'll see. Uh, the existing building structures in the lot for which proposed the yard size requested were erected prior to July 3rd, 1991, or the lot is a vacant, nonconforming lot of record. The house was built prior to July 3rd, 1991. Thank you. Uh, the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. You may want to cover that one a little bit. Yeah, so we, we believe that we're in compliance here because the other um, properties in the neighborhood are uh, uh, residences that have sleeping quarters primarily on the second floor. Um, we are expanding the second floor, but without this two feet four, we have spaces due to existing circulation, existing stairs that are next to non-functional. Um, we have 11 feet clear on the first floor to take away two feet four to the outside wall brings under nine feet, another eight inches or so brings us you know, close to eight, eight and a half inside, which is, I don't think a bedroom anyone um, would, would consider to be very functional. Okay. Uh, due to the physical features of the lot and the location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct and for the proposed expansion of management or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. You know, the, current, the current first floor, which we're trying to match in order to meet the character-based standards, already exists um, across the, the setbacks uh, in order to have a fully functional uh, addition. We would actually be taking away two and a half feet for the length of the building on the first floor, which, which is it, there again provides non-functional space on the inside. Thank you. And the impact of the enlargement, expansion, new building, or a structure on existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirement. Uh, we feel that the architecture is going to, to be more compatible with the, the, the character-based codes of the district. Um, if we maintain the current setbacks on the second floor, we feel like we'll be in con contrary to that. And uh, the applicant has not commenced construction enlargement? We have not. Um, any discussion from the board? To me, this is pretty straightforward. No. Um, so, uh, why don't we just go through with the questions and we'll come back to the motion. Uh, the existing buildings or structures on the lot were created 19, prior to 1991. Um, why don't we start with uh, Mr. Hebert? What? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the chair. We should start with Mr. Hebert. Um, Yes, clearly he has stated that the building was erected prior to 1991. Really? Yes. <laughs> Agree, it's a fact. You should have responded yes. Okay. Yes, I mean, we've already established that it is fact. Yes. So, uh, all in favor of one being that? Unanimous, thank you. The requested very, uh, reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or the occupant of the property to use the enjoyment, enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as the other personal properties are utilized in the zoning district. All yours, sir. By, <coughs> excuse me, so by adding, by, by providing this addition, you are, the, the applicant has proven that they'll be able to, um, excuse me, sorry, allergies. Um, the applicant is clearly able to um, construct a second floor, which does sort of bring it into more um, similar um, uses of other houses in the neighborhood. 
what it does is it brings brings it into conformance with the character zone uh, code as far as having a straight wall going up. Plus it enlarges the upstairs. Makes the rooms what? Two feet? Yeah, two feet. Two feet four. Two feet four inches larger. I agree with Mr. Blaze. I mean, I think they're asking for a very, very minimal relief so they can enjoy their property the same way that other properties, similar properties in the area do. Yeah. I agree as well. Going from eight and a half feet to 11 feet in that room is a reasonable request, and it still stays within the character code. Yeah, I like that you're coming right straight down rather than jutting in and jutting out and everything, but I honestly don't ever think I've had one on one side looking for four and a half to five and a half inches. <laughs> I think that's got to be a first. And if I can um, also add the roof line coming down, it also brings it closer to character. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I agree uh, with the par all parties. And I think there's another pad. Due to the physical features and the size of the lot uh, or the location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct. I'm sure we did not. Thank you very much. All in favor of two being up. And thank you. Sorry. Uh, due to the that's why you're around. Due to the physical features of the lot or the location of existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion enlargement on new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. So as the applicant has stated, um, it's not very practical because you would be uh, adding additional roof lines, therefore not really bringing it in with ca into character with the other house in the neighborhood. This way it's a lot cleaner and better fits the character base code. I agree. I agree, Mr. Hebert. <coughs> I agree. Depends on who's designing. Some people, like you said, want all these different roof lines, <laughs> but I agree, I like this one. Uh, and again, I think due to the physical features of the lot, it makes sense. It's consistent with what the new plans are. And that's the goal of uh, all that work that was done with the charrettes. And so I'm, I'm in favor. Uh, number three being met, all favor? That's unanimous, thank you. The impacts and effects of the enlargement expansion of new building and structure on existing uses in the neighborhood will not substantially be different from or greater than the impacts and effects of the building or structure which conforms to the art size requirements. Some would argue that um, by requesting these uh, additional inches that uh, it might be substantially different, but I'm not going to make that argument. So I think they, uh, I would agree with this. Uh, I'd agree with it. I don't think there's going to be a big, big effect with two feet and five inches. <laughs> no, there's not a substantial difference. Yeah, and sometimes we ask people to move it in to more make it in conformance, but in this it's have a detrimental effect if you moved it in. It looks much better this way. And I agree the impacts and effects are minor. Actually, they bring it more into compliance, which is the goal of the character-based work. I'm glad and Mr. Longstaff still has control of the things he's not totally bought in on. <laughs> that's important. Because to be in a cancer view, that's important to me. If he didn't have that control, I would not be ready to vote on this. Um, so I, I'm in favor of it. Uh, all in favor of four being that? And then the last is you haven't started any construction or lodgement. And uh, no. Here we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way down. I'm not going to challenge you to do that. Yeah, All in favor that it's been met. That's unanimous. Thank you. Do you have a motion for the, for the uh, I move to appeal. I move to approve. <laughs> Excuse you me. Need to appeal number 2615 as presented. Exactly. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Uh, the motion is approved to appeal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's my approved. goodness. Thanks a lot. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, any comments from uh, Mr. Longstaff and the Um No other than I think that since the last time we met, we did approve the new amendments to the Higgins Beach character based code. <laughs> Not sure. I think the timing was close, but anyway, so we have a whole new, well, not a whole new, it's just a few tweaks to the existing ordinance. It is online, so if you go online on the website and open up the zoning ordinance, you will see the new changes there. They're highlighted. And so, yes, and so next time we will have a quiz. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Anything that we should be overly concerned about? Uh, just to, for us to wrap okay. our heads around. No, because, I mean, again, we, we're trying to... 
I'm trying to only bring the dimensional stuff to the board and, and trying to guide people into compliance with the character elements. I, I know we, at some point we're going to run into a <laughs> wall on that, but we'll deal with that when it comes. We did do a very nice, uh, I think a well-received presentation to the uh, at the Maine Municipal Association uh, annual convention this past last week. Uh, Councillor Donovan um, and our former planning director Dan Bacon and I stood up, the three stooges, <laughs> and we stood up and we did a, a pretty good job at, at describing the process that we went through on that Higgins speech um, character code. And it was very well attended and we were told that, that the attendance was up and it was because of us, so we'll take that. <laughs> but it was, uh, no, it's, it's if people are finding it interesting and there's more and more fan based codes being adopted in Maine. So it's up to you. You know, it's tied to that. I actually, heard, I actually heard somebody you know, try to make the argument that uh, they didn't get what, you know, they, they, nobody listens to them. And I stopped them and I said, wait a minute. <laughs> you can't say that. It's just not true. Good try, but it's not true. <laughs> I watched the, what they, these people do and I, I, they went way out of their way to help everybody. And he kind of shut up after that. Basically, <laughs> so. So I think I think that builds the credibility of the point in the town. I think it's a great job. Yeah. Uh, any any board members any comments? Uh, I have fears around having Mr. Hebert speak first because he's <laughs> yeah. really struggling. So he was appealing it with somebody else. <laughs> hey, I didn't. I didn't want to. It's the pressure. You felt it. He was yeah. trying to be appealing. <laughs> I'm trying to be appealing. In my appeal. I, I have a motion to adjourn. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Second. Favor. Uh, We're adjourned. Thank you very much. I'm trying to make a joke.